Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the May 13th, 2021 planning and work session meeting of our State Board of Education. I'm Eric Davis, chair of the board, and I call this meeting to order. I want to welcome all of my colleagues, staff and advisors, visitors, online listeners, and Twitter followers. And I remind the audience and those listening that this body meets monthly with its official meeting typically scheduled for the first Thursday of the month. Today's meeting follows our biannual planning and work session, and we'll have a closing keynote as the highlight of that meeting from one of our North Carolina public school students in just a few moments. I remind our visitors and online listeners that you can follow the meeting online and see all of our materials by going to SBE meetings at stateboard.ncpublicschools.gov. Board members, you're reminded that it's our duty to avoid conflicts of interest and the appearance of conflicts of interest as we handle the work of this board. Does any member of the board know of any conflict of interest or any appearance of conflict with respect to any matters coming before us at this meeting? If so, please state them for the record. If during the course of the meeting, you become aware of an actual or apparent conflict of interest, please bring the matter to the attention of the chair. It will then be your duty to abstain from participating in discussion on the matter and from voting on the matter. Board members, you've seen the agenda for over a week and had the opportunity to review it. I ask if there are any requests for changes to the agenda. Hearing none, I request a motion for approval. Mr. Chairman, one day Hall, I make a motion that we approve the agenda as presented. Motion by Mr. Hall. Is there a second? Second. Second by Vice Chair Duncan. Dr. Townsend Smith, please call the roll to capture the vote. Yes, sir. Ms. Kamnix? Yes. Yeah. Mr. Hall? Yes. Dr. Tipton Rogers? Yes. Ms. White? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Mr. Ford? Yes. Vice Chair Duncan? Yes. Chair Davis? Yes. Motion carries. We have an agenda. I now call on uh, Vice Chair Duncan to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States, United States of America and to the Republic, Republic for which it stands, one nation, nation under God, God, indivisible, with liberty, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. And now as the uh, highlight of our planning and work session, I recognize Mr. Matthew Bristow Smith to introduce our closing keynote speaker. Good morning, Chair Davis, Vice Chair Duncan, Superintendent Truitt, Lieutenant Governor, Treasurer Falwell, and respective members of the Board of Education, both those in person and online. Our two days of planning and work session time have been rich as we have dug deep into the role of the board in creating public school systems that serve each and every scholar in our great state. As we kick off our formal May board meeting this morning, it is only right and proper that we consider ourselves and center our work through the voice and the lens of students. And so I have the great privilege and high honor this morning of introducing one of our very own from Edgecombe County Public Schools and Edgecombe Early College High School, Mr. Abdur Rakib Ibn Gant. It is not my place to front load Abdur's message to you, nor to provide context for what he is about to say. His lived experiences in and out of school speak for themselves. What I will say is that I love this guy. My wife and my two daughters love him. His school family and blood family back in Edgecombe love him. And his remarks today are being recorded so that we can share them with our entire student body. We get back home later today. For five years, there's been a sort of role reversal in my relationship with Abdur. I think I have learned as much from him, probably more so, than he from me. The student has truly become the master. And yesterday, when Ben and Adam challenged us to empathize and to define before we ideate, 
I remembered Abdur. I immediately thought of him and the message he's bringing us today. I also thought of that excerpt, the state constitution that's on the wall behind Chair Davis and Superintendent Truitt today. The one that reminds us of the right to the privilege of a sound basic education for each and every scholar in our great state. At a time, 1.5 million scholars. With that, I present to you Abdur Rakib Ibn Gant. Good morning, Chair Davis, Vice Chair Duncan, Lieutenant Governor Robertson, Treasurer Farwell, Superintendent Truitt, and respective members of the board. My name is Abdur Rakib Ibn and I am a proud member of the graduating class of 2021 from S. Chrome Early College High School. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today about my journey in public education. I come to you today to share my story, my perspective, and my voice. Let me tell you about my dad. My dad was not the type of guy to give up easily, which is why the SWAT team had to break down our front door to make his arrest. The man was a walking contradiction, respected by our Philadelphia community, but abusive behind closed doors. No wonder our family could not find anyone in the neighborhood to help us when we needed it. My dad underestimated how strong my mom could be tired of his lies, cheating, and abuse. She had power too. She decided to leave before things got too bad and before the kids got too old. But things went from bad to worse too quickly. Chase attempted murder, the SWAT team arriving. Their battering rams left marks on our front door. I was six months old when my mom, Shirley, escaped with our family to North Carolina. Mom was always transparent with us about why our dad was not around. It was heavy for me as a child to know that my dad tried to kill my mom. Looking back, I realized how much it bothered me and also shaped me. I felt the need to be everything that dad wasn't. Good, honest, strong, powerful, grounded. I refused to be broken by a bad situation, but it was not easy. We were in a new place, strange schools, no support network, all on our own. Sometimes things were dark, but I learned to see in the dark. We moved around, lived in a homeless shelter for two months, weathered a couple 500 year floods, finally put down roots in Mill Lakes State Trailer Park in Tarboro. I attended seven different schools in just nine years. Then a Chinese tire company bought our whole neighborhood, including the trailer park to build a factory. So we moved again. Let me be real honest with you for a minute. I was a good killer at elementary school. I shot hard, I wanted to be there. I was curious, I liked learning. I hit me hard in middle school. I had spent a lot of my time in in school and out of school suspension. I had anger building aside without an outlet and it led to me expressing myself in negative ways. I just didn't care anymore. Our family had just moved into a homeless shelter and no one at school seemed to get me. Later on, I learned the word, I learned the word for all of this, trauma. Both of my siblings dropped out of high school. Mom worked two jobs, still does. The trailer rocked when the wind blew, but our family had a code. I was going to make it. I will be the one. I feel that pressure every day. The first to graduate high school, the first to go to college, the first to start a new path in life. It's like a hand on my back all the time. It's been tough to trailblaze a new path while watching the people I grew up with go different ways. Here's what people don't get about opportunities. If you can't access them, there are no good to you. At Edgecombe Early College, when I was a sophomore, we started building time during the regular school day for our clubs to meet because we realized that holding them after school didn't work for kids who rode the bus home. We wanted to make sure everyone had access to clubs, not just those who could provide their own transportation. We had to change our system. This is another thing that people don't quite get about, about opportunities. It's not just enough for them to exist. Students need to see how they fit in. Don't 
the See why they where they fit in and why an opportunity should matter to them. Kids need to have a, a reason to want that opportunity, to feel it, to be motivated to take a risk, to try something new, to stretch themselves. As the only black male in my graduating class, I have been willing to take the road less traveled while everyone else who looked like me went to a traditional high school or dropped out of school. My people at Edgecombe Early College have shown me a degree of love and support that I have never felt before. I do see myself in my school. They have worked hard to make sure I, had, I could access the opportunities available to me, like the solar panel class I took on the weekends, just as an example. See, the plan field is not always level in the room, but in school, the playing field should be level for every single student, period. My school family helped me become my full self. I discovered I am very good at math and now plan to be an engineer. In high school, I have had the opportunity and access to do the things I love, such as construction, working with technology such as 3D printers and solar panels, and visiting local manufacturing plants such as Cummins Diesel Engine Plant and LS Cable. Along the way, I also discovered an interest in learning more about my past, which led me to contacting my siblings on my dad's side after 18 years. I have lived our school motto, be yourself, leave completely changed. There are now 16 black males at our school coming up behind me. They count on me to lead the way. I am graduating this month with my high school diploma, an associate of science degree, a certificate in facility maintenance, OSHA 10 and 30 certifications and a solar en energy installation certificate. I have earned $58,000 in scholarships so far, including the Horatio Alger Scholarship, the Mary Fibby Howard Scholarship, and the McBride Scholarship. This summer, I am completing a paid internship at Corning's Edgecombe County facility, which was built right across the street from where I used to live. In August, I'll be attending NCANT to become an Aggie engineer. I know myself. I have a vision for my future. I am ready for what comes next. And this is what we owe each and every scholar in our NC public schools. As proud as I am of my accomplishments, I should not be the exception. I should be the norm. The marks from the SWAT team are still on the front door of my old family house in Philadelphia. I'm ready to put my own marks on the door, the door of opportunity, and not just put marks on it, but I'm ready to push it wide open. Thank you. Wow, that's all I can say. You were uh, one inspirational young man that we are so proud of. And I'm sure my colleagues uh, would like to uh, express their appreciation to you, Mr. Ford. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, do it first and foremost. You're looking good, man. Your locks uh, are longer than mine, man. Um, not sure how I feel about that, but uh, in all seriousness, um, young brother, you. Uh, you remind me so much of why I entered teaching in the first place. And uh, I think that you embody the fact that everybody has a story. And too often when we see statistics, the adults don't always take the time as some of your early teachers maybe didn't and, and, and how you perhaps felt to investigate that story. I entered teaching, working with young people who felt very similarly. Um, in particular, those who had kind of dropped out or weren't attending. And my task was to figure out why they weren't coming to school. And what you learn very quickly is that similar to what Mr. Bristol Smith said, in that environment, the teacher actually becomes the student. It's your job to listen. And um, what I heard there was a story of resilience, not in the traditional sense where we just learn to deal with hardship, but in a sense that you had some skills. You mentioned sometimes it was dark, but I learned to see in the dark. And that struck me because oftentimes we define students by what they don't have or what he what he talked about was the skill that developed as a result of a circumstance. And despite the fact that in the real world things may not be equal, that didn't deter you from finding a way to overcome those circumstances and set an example for those coming behind you. And I think that's that's the mission right there, man. Like in every aspect of your life that will continue to be 
objective to lift while you climb, right? To move obstacles out of the way that maybe were there for you, but to do it for, for th the folks coming behind you. And I just want to uh, encourage you and tell you I'm proud of you. I don't know you, but I'm already proud of you. And um, I'm happy that you found a place where you can fit in at Edgecombe, uh, where your identity is affirmed and you've been loved on. And hopefully you get the same experience at uh, North Carolina T. And uh, maybe you'll be sitting next to me up here sometime soon. I don't know. Uh, but thank you so much for sharing your story. Other comments? Uh, Superintendent Truitt. Good morning, Abdur. It's nice to see you again. I would like to say something specific to you, and then I would like to comment to the, the group at large. It would be very easy for me to say to you that I'm sorry that you had to go through what you've been through in your life. And by that, I mean the responsibilities that have been placed on you. As a mother, it breaks my heart that you have had to have that kind of pressure on you at the tender age that you are and were when you were even younger. But my friend, you and your lived experiences have made you the person that you are. And while I wish that it hadn't been that way for you, you are going to be a light for the world now, which in and of itself is an enormous responsibility. But God has given you the strength that you need to be the person that you are, the person that you were, and the person that you're going to be. And that's amazing, and so are you. Thank you. You're, you're, thank you. My takeaway from our visit at Edgecombe Early College High School is something that I've shared a couple of times publicly, but I'm going to share it again. That day, which was a day that all of the candidates for this role that I have the privilege to serve in now, <clears throat> excuse me, were invited to Edgecombe Early College High School to spend a day with the students there. And we included a local traditional high school in that event. And it, it became very apparent, um, at least to me, that the leadership qualities in you and your classmates were uh, unlike things that I had seen in traditional high schools. And a student from the traditional high school at one point said to the group that I was sitting in, well, why can't I go to that high school? What's so special about Edgecombe Early College High School? And why can't I go there? And that has stuck with me from that day. And so to further honor what, you're, what you have shared, Abdur, the experience that you had at your high school needs to be the experience for all children. And I would encourage all of the educators listening and in the room to endeavor to provide that kind of experience for all children. So thank you again so much for sharing yourself with us today. Other comments? Mr. Mass Bristow Smith. Thank you, Chair Davis. And, um, and Abdur, I just wanted to ask you if you could reflect on um, not where you are now, but if you could step back five years to coming into our school as a freshman, um, the kinds of experiences that you looking back have had were not necessarily part of a linear plan we had moving forward. In other words, when you came in as a freshman, we didn't say, hey, these are the five years worth of learning experiences that we have in plan. We didn't talk about the solar panel um, the class that you took, and we didn't talk about the rural student town hall where you got to meet the superintendent and members of the board and others. 
but can you talk a little bit about like the habits of mind that you've had to have so that you could embrace these opportunities as they arose? Because sometimes there, there's a learning experience that's planned and there are other opportunities that you build around students as you get to know them and figure out what their passions are and what, what matters to them. Um, and, and, and just kind of speak a little bit to where your head has been over the course of those five years um, and how you got to where you are today. So thing when it comes to getting these opportunities and stuff, you can't be scared to take a risk. You have to see everything as a learning experience. A lot of people are scared to do things because they scared they might fail. But that's where you must up at. You don't need to look at these situations as failures. You need to look at them as learning opportunities. So you should be willing to take every opportunity head on, ready to learn. Either if you succeed or fail, you should be willing to learn from everything that you go through rather than dwelling on it. And instead of like wishing it, it went this way or this or that way. You take and you learn what to do next so that don't happen again. Thank you. Your discussion with us was just incredible. Like to, to and it reminds me of why we're all here. All the adults in this room are here because of kids that we have in our classrooms. And you're an example of the success that our program can have when we do things the way that they should be done so that we're letting our kids embrace opportunity. And your perspective on that opportunity, I think, is really important because I think a lot of times we say, oh, well, the opportunity was given, kids didn't seize it. And you really kind of helped us understand how we need to frame those opportunities so that kids have the, the ability to be able to step into those opportunities. Um, and also just your perspective on failure just makes my heart sing because so many people are afraid of failing and they forget that that failure is the way that we get better and where we learn and where we grow. Um, I am so excited to see what you do at A&T. Like I can, I'm going to start following you and keep in touch and find out what's going on because you are going to do amazing things. And I know that you're going to be a leader in North Carolina and we're going to all say, you know what? I saw him right before he graduated from high school and I got to hear him speak. And I knew at that moment that he was going to go on to do great things. So seize your future. You're going to be amazing. And we're all going to be here watching you and cheering you on. And I just can't wait to see what you do. Thank you, Ms. Stover. To my colleagues online, would you like to anyone have a comment? I'm sure they're a bit overwhelmed as we are too, Abdur, but uh, last year, Duncan. I'm going to stand up so I can see you around all the plexiglass. <laughs> uh, we had a lot of reflections down this line. Thank you for your inspiring remarks. They're truly meaningful and they're truly needed. Uh, I want to wish you the very best as you go forward. I look forward to continuing to hear about your accomplishments. Uh, we're so proud of the ones you've made so far, but the ones that are still to come, I'm sure are going to be breathtaking for all of us. And I wish you and your family, as you go in your journey together, uh, a greater sense of peace and a, a great path and journey forward. Thank you so much for being here with us. So in closing, uh, colleagues, would you join me once again in congratulating Abdur? Thank you again for inspiring us all. Have a great day. <clears throat> okay. So, um, before we move to our recognitions today, I would like to take just a moment and express on behalf of my colleagues, uh, appreciation to the many members of our education team that over the past uh, year or more have done so much for our students. Uh, that includes those that are in administrative roles, uh, every principal, 
every teacher, every school nutrition worker, bus driver, counselor, psychologist, social worker, teacher assistant, literacy facilitator, everyone who's touched students like Abdur and have made such a lasting impact on their lives, particularly in times of great challenge like the last 12 months. Uh, our hearts full of gratitude to each one of you. Uh, you're the heroes of this past 12 months, and we're grateful for what you do every day for, our, for each and every one of our students. So on behalf of the board, thank you. And now for more specific special recognitions, I'd like to uh, first recognize Mr. Joseph Reaper for the Presidential Awards for Excellence in Mathematics and Science Teaching. Correct. He's going to. I was just going to introduce him. Please do. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. <laughs> All right. Uh, good morning, Chair Davis, Vice Chair Duncan, Lieutenant Governor Robinson, Superintendent Truett, and members of the board. It is with great honor that we bring before you the Presidential Awards for Excellence in Math and Science Teaching. And on behalf of Dr. Christy Gall, Deputy Superintendent of Innovation, and Ms. Beverly Vance, Science and Mathematics Section Chief, I would like to introduce Joseph Reaper, our secondary math consultant. Joseph, you are on. Good morning, Superintendent Truett. Chairman Davis, Vice Chairman Duncan, State Board of Education members, and honored guests. As the state coordinator for the presidential awards, it gives me a great pleasure to be with you this morning to honor some of the best teachers in North Carolina. Our 2020 finalists for the presidential awards for excellence in mathematics and science teaching. The presidential awards are the highest honor bestowed by the U.S. government for our K-12 science, technology, engineering, mathematics, and computer science teachers. Our finalists demonstrate the expertise and dedication of our teaching corps. Our finalists have exhibited a profoundly positive impact, not only to students in their classrooms, but to their fellow educators as well. The Presidential Awards is administered by the National Science Foundation on behalf of the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. Of our six finalists being honored here today, two of them will be named as awardees. These awardees will receive a certificate signed by the President of the United States, a $10,000 award, and will be invited to attend an award ceremony in Washington, D.C. I would like to offer a special welcome to our 2020 finalists and their students who may be listening online. Some of our finalists and students could not join us today due to EOG administration. Our first finalist is Rebecca Chris, a fourth grade teacher at Stedham Elementary School in Cumberland County Schools. Rebecca is a finalist in the mathematics category, and as part of her application, submitted a lesson in which students explored the concept of unit fractions in relationship to whole through real life context. Our next finalist is Sarah Lilly a third grade teacher at Clark Elementary School in Vance County Schools. Sarah is a finalist in the mathematics category and submitted a lesson in which students explored the concept of area. Our next finalist is Sarah Rimmery, a fourth grade teacher at Trindale Elementary School in Randolph County Schools. Sarah is a finalist in the mathematics category and submitted a lesson in which students worked with area and parameter with rectangles and squares. Our next finalist is Covey Denton, a fifth grade teacher at Sally B. Howard School in Wilson, North Carolina. Covey is a finalist in the science category and submitted a lesson in which students explored forces and motion. Our next finalist is Andy Webb, 
a K-2 teacher and instructional coach at Forest Hills Global Elementary in New Hanover Schools. Andy is a finalist in the, South, in the science category and submitted a kindergarten lesson in which students distinguish between living and non-living things. And our last finalist is Polly Westfall, a third grade teacher at Union Elementary School in Brunswick County Schools. Polly is a finalist in the science category and submitted a lesson in which students used the engineering design process and the four C's with a focus on improving the product. As with just about everything else, the pandemic has led to delays and cancellations of our normal activities. While we could not bring our finalists for our normal recognition events, I was able to deliver their recognition items in March. As part of their notification of being named a finalist, I send a letter to the finalist principals to surprise them in front of their class or in a teacher's meeting. As you can see here, Polly's principal printed the letter on poster paper and eventually hung it outside the school. I saw her classroom. The finalists this year also received a backpack embroidered with the presidential award seal as shown by Rebecca. Here you can see Sarah and Kobe holding their frame certificate from the Association of State Supervisors of Mathematics and the Council of State Supervisors of Science. They are also holding a personalized engraved award from the North Carolina Presidential Awards Program. Normally, we would be providing a recognition luncheon for our finalists. Thankfully, our federal partners granted us an exemption on gift cards, which allowed us to provide Sarah and the other finalists gift cards to various restaurants instead. In our last picture, Andy is showing all of the recognition items she received, including the certificate that is normally presented to them here at this board meeting. Our 2020 finalist applications have been submitted to the National Science Foundation for the National Review. We hope to know who will be named the awardees soon. The North Carolina finalists for the 2021 award cycle have been chosen and will be announced in the coming weeks. We hope to return to a somewhat normal recognition cycle in the fall in which we will recognize those finalists and our recent awardees. Once again, congrat congratulations to our 2020 presidential awards finalists. Please join me in congratulating our winners. Thank you, Joseph. And now we're going to turn to another recognition. This is the United States Senate Youth. And with us today virtually is Dr. Lori Major Carlin, and she is going to present those. Thank you, Dr. Mullenix. Good morning, Superintendent Truitt, Chair Davis, and members and advisors of the State Board. It is my honor to present the 2021 United States Senate Youth Scholarship recipients from North Carolina. The Senate Youth Program is sponsored by the Hearst Foundation and provides unique educational experiences for outstanding high school students interested in pursuing careers in public service. In North Carolina, this program is facilitated by DPI and delivered to the Central Studies section. I would like to thank Michelle McLaughlin for her thoughtful stewardship of the program. These students will each receive a $10,000 scholarship and we're able to meet with other outstanding students for a virtual week. Our first recipient is Samuel Oliver Hinner. He is the son of proud parents, Colleen and Oliver Hinner. Samuel Hinner is a graduating senior and the current student Senate president of the North Carolina School of Science and Mathematics. He served as class president in both ninth and 10th grade. In his junior year, he was elected to serve as a junior senator. Sam's highest aspiration in life is to improve conditions for as many people as possible. To this end, he has been involved in community service initiatives such as Red Cross blood drives and programming a website to help his local school district make data entry easier for the exceptional children's department. <laughs> 
Sam also works with the Borgen Project, a national campaign working to make poverty a focus of U.S. national foreign policy. Working with the project, he advocates for legislation to fight global poverty. Sam believes that legislatures have the power to improve lives. In his future, he wants to become involved in legislative politics and serve others. In the fall, Samuel will begin his post-secondary studies as a freshman attending UNC Chapel Hill. Samuel plans to study public policy. We're going to get to hear from him in just a moment. Chairman Davis and members of the National State Board of Education, State Superintendent Catherine Truitt, and the K-12 Social Studies section at DPI present Mr. Samuel Oliver Henner, North Carolina winner of the 2021 United States Senate Youth Scholarship. Hello, thank you for having me today. I'm with you today. It's a real honor to be here. And uh, it really has been a fantastic experience as a part of the Senate Youth Program from the application process. Ms. McLaughlin did a very uh, fantastic job with uh, every aspect of the process, making it not just a uh, process where uh, to get selected, but also an educational experience with the essays and the creative topics that we use and the uh, interview questions. So I really appreciate that that experience and she did a great job of being there for every student as we made our way through the process. And then the Senate Youth Program itself, Washington Week was a really fantastic experience to get to uh, learn from all these role models, uh, these public officials who had been able to have a huge impact on the lives of others and really make those a little better place and see how throughout that experience they've been to been able to keep their principles, keep their integrity and still make a really uh, amazing impact on the world has been a huge inspiration and has really inspired me to uh, get even more involved in uh, public policy and hope to make a difference in the world. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Samuel. Our second scholarship recipient is Gabriel Schul. Gabe is the son of proud parents Monica Bosha and Mark Jewell. Samuel is an outstanding 2020 graduate of Charlotte Country Day School. Gabriel Schul currently serves as a student representative to the North or to the Charlotte Mecklenburg Board of Education. As both a junior and senior, he has served in student government as a student representative. Over the past year, he has also served as an elected officer on the Charlotte Mecklenburg Youth Council. On the Youth Council, he has organized initiatives such as poll working, voter registration drives, and city cleanups. He gets to use his leadership skills while leading meetings of students and coordinating town halls with the municipal, county, and school board officials. Gabriel is a four-year member of the speech and debate team and has been a captain on the team the past two years. Gabriel has learned the importance of empathy and leadership. His desire to be a USSY delegate stems from his drive to understand those around him and to challenge himself to serve and act in the best interests of others. In the fall, Gabriel will begin his post-secondary studies as a freshman attending Pomona College. Gabriel plans to study philosophy or politics. Chairman Davis and members of the North Carolina State Board of Education, State Superintendent Catherine Truitt, and the K-12 Social Studies section at DPI present Mr. Gabriel Francis Schul, North Carolina winner of the 2021 United States Senate Youth Scholarship. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Um, and a special thank you for the NC Department of Public Instruction and Ms. McLaughlin and the team for organizing the application process. And of course, to the Hearst Foundation for making this um, whole opportunity possible for me. And also a special shout out to Sam for being a fantastic co-delegate throughout the entire process. Congratulations to these outstanding students and best wishes to them as they pursue higher education. Thank you. Hey, thank you. And I believe uh, Dr. Stigall has the next um, recognition. Good morning, Mr. Chair. We actually have a special guest who will be recognizing one of our very own, Mr. Trey Michael. Uh, I'd like to uh, welcome Paul. Uh, I'm going to mess up this name, Helder Prism, I believe, from Skills USA. He's the executive director to uh, recognize Trey Michael. Paul? Yes, thank you. I'm Paul Heidepreen, uh, executive director of Skills USA. Uh, the Outstanding Educator Award is 
It's one of Skills USA's highest recognitions. The Skills USA Outstanding Educator of the Year is awarded to outstanding individuals who guide Skills USA members to become leaders in their chosen fields. It is given only when the Skills USA National Board of Directors wants to honor an exceptional educator for their service and dedication to career and technical education and Skills USA. Trey Michael believes in the importance of student engagement and development and has always been a champion of career and technical student organizations or CTSOs, believing that every CTE teacher should also be an active CTSO advisor. He has been instrumental in requiring every new CTE teacher in North Carolina to go through a 40 hour new teacher induction program within their first three years with approximately one third of that uh, NTI program being devoted to CTSOs at their core mission level. Through our deep discussions and his involvement with Skills USA over the years, he has been with the Department of Public Instruction. Trey is well versed in the Skills USA framework, which promotes student development of personal, workplace, and technical skills grounded in academics, and believes in its inclusion within CTE classrooms across the state. Trey has been one of our Skills USA North Carolina corporate members where he serves as a voting delegate for North Carolina. He has also attended several of our national Skills USA conferences to not only attend those corporate meetings, but to support our great student members as they compete and showcase their technical skills against the best from across the United States. I proudly nominated Trey Michael for the Skills USA Outstanding Educator Award, not only for his commitment to Skills USA and CTSOs, but also for his passion and for how Skills USA changes students' lives in all of our activities, programs, engagements, and opportunities. Thank you, State Board of Education, for allowing me to recognize a great and passionate supporter of Skills USA and our career technical students in North Carolina. Could you join me in congratulating Trey? Thank you very much. I appreciate you, uh, Paul. Thank you for nominating me and Dr. Stigall. Thank you for promoting this and. Uh, I can't say enough good things about the team. Uh, I'm the face of this today. But uh, I am very blessed that every single day I get to work with Paul and Dr. Stigall and many of the others in this room and a, a great state board and a great superintendent, uh, Rod Likens, um, Brandon Ramirez, and Mr. Glenn Barefoot, who actually helped kind of get me going in the world of CTE uh, many, many years ago, uh, Peyton Holland, who was our previous uh, executive director, and then, of course, our great team. Uh, that works with our students in the curriculum areas every single day, Dr. David Barber, Jim Presley, Craig Pendergraft, Angela LeMay, and uh, Dolores Piali. But it is exactly, uh, many of you have said this already. Uh, I don't know if you were a member of Skills USA uh, locally, but you are exactly what we strive to, to work for every single day. And uh, I was uh, challenged and uh, reinvigorated with your words, and I appreciate that. And it's because of you that I do all of these things. Uh, that we do to promote Skills USA and all of our other student organizations uh, and do great things for our children. So thank you for, for recognizing me and I really appreciate it. Thank you. Congratulations. And for our next recognition, uh, I believe Dr. Silver has the honors. Dr. Silver, are you on mute? Thank you, Deanna. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Chairman Davis, Lieutenant Governor Robinson, Superintendent Truett, and all respective board members. I serve as DPI's liaison to our North Carolina State Advisory Council on Indian Education. And today we would like to take a moment to recognize those who have given so generously of their time to serve on this advisory council. They have demonstrated knowledge of and advocacy for our American Indian student population during their respective tenures. Today, we have three outgoing members to recognize and one very special um, liaison who we'll recognize. The first is Connie Harmon. She's a member of the Lumbee Tribe of North Carolina. 
She currently serves as an elementary school teacher in Wake County Public Schools, and she has served two terms on the council. Next, we'd like to recognize Ms. Alicia Lena. She serves one term. She's a member of the Kohiri tribe, and she serves as both a parent and educator. She's an educator in Clinton City Schools. And the last member we'd like to recognize is Mr. Will Paul. He has also served two terms as the advisory council on media education. He's a member of the Tahoe tribe. He has worked 20 years in education and currently works for Greenville County School um, as a CBIS coordinator in behavior liaison. And lastly, one last recognition. Um, we have her for a little while longer, but we wanted to take this opportunity to recognize Dr. Olivia Oxendon, who has served as a state board liaison to the council. She has been a tireless advocate for American Indian children in her role as a state board member. Prior to that, she worked with Stacey, um, was actually here in the agency when the council was actually started and has advocated for reforms in legislation around safety and membership and always been a tireless advocate. And I would say on a personal note, it's been my great pleasure to work with her. There aren't a lot of other American Indian women um, at the state level for education, so I appreciate her so much as a mentor. And while um, we may not always agree on things, one thing I know is that she always comes from an advocacy of knowing. And that is such a comfort when you have someone who comes from a similar background as you and can, I mean, you can have that level of understanding. In fact, just last week she shared with me that her father was a tobacco farmer and I grew up on a tobacco farm. My grandfather was a tobacco farmer. And so just having those things in common has made her a very special advocate for American Indian students and a mentor to me. So I wanted to take the time to personally thank her and on behalf of the council also thank her for her service to the Student Advisory Council on Indian Education. Thank you. We certainly thank all of you for their service. Thank you, Dr. Silver. Would you join me in uh, congratulating our awardees? Excellent. And uh, for our final award, I believe I'll turn to Ms. White and Mr. Machado. Ms. White, are you speaking? Not yet. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay, thanks. Good morning, everyone. I'm Amy White, and I am the chair of the Education, Innovation, and Charter School Committee. And it gives me great pleasure, and also quite a bit of sadness, um, as we recognize Mr. Alex Quigley this morning. Alex has been the chair of the Charter School Advisory Board for the last five years, and it has been um, my distinct honor to call him colleague, advocate, innovator, leader, teacher, most of all, friend. He's someone that if I had a question about anything that the Charter School Advisory Board um, was discussing, I could call and he always shot it from the hips. He always tells the truth and he always advocates for the students. If you don't know much about Alex, he is the principal of Healthy Start Academy in Durham, and he's committed to bringing excellence and driving improved student outcomes. And um, I always say you need to put the proof in the pudding. And um, the proof in that is clearly, clearly visible in that in the last six years, he has brought the overall school performance score at Healthy Start from 35% to 54% and folks, that's a 19% gain. Alex is going to be leaving his position as chair of the Charter School Advisory Board, but he is not leaving the charter school community. He is going to um, use his additional time, an enormous amount of time previously de dedicated to meeting with and leading the Charter School Advisory Board um, to continuing that pursuit of excellence at Healthy Start. And um, it's my pleasure um, to, to say thank you to Alex, not only for your advocacy for charter schools in general, but most importantly, always keeping students at the center um, of everything that you do.
Mr. Quigley, would you like to make a few? Yeah, remarks? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, I would just absolutely. Uh, I just want to thank Ms. White um, as as well of all all of uh, this the these board the state board. I am uh, exceedingly grateful for the opportunity to serve as certainly on the charter school advisory board and then to have the opportunity to present and uh, work with you at, in all areas of charter school policy approval authorization uh, it has it has been a, a joy I've, I've loved the work i've learned a lot more than i've, I've given and, I, and I've, it's been a uh, truly humbling and an honor and a privilege to serve and, and i'm definitely going to miss it uh and but i i'm i'm really grateful for the time and I, I thank you for giving me the opportunity mr quigley we thank you for your service i'm sure you won't miss the many questions that we've asked you over the last few years but we appreciate not only your patience but really your superb leadership in all aspects of uh leading your own school as well as uh, a state leader on the charter school advisory board so thank you so much Thank you. Um, next, we uh, will move forward with our COVID-19 updates. Uh, colleagues, you may recall that um, recently, as was directed by legislation, we entered into a contract with the ABC Collaborative. That legislation also required periodic reporting to the board and General Assembly to track the metrics of schools operating under Plan A. And today, we will receive an initial update from the ABC Collaborative on their work. And at this time, I recognize Drs. Benjamin and Zimmerman for this presentation. Okay. Superintendent's report first. Go to the superintendent. Okay. Can you, mm -hmm. you okay? OK, we're going to make a slight change in our program and I'll turn to the superintendent for her report. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Chair Davis for <clears throat> the opportunity. To speak to the group today. Um, I'm, I'm really excited to deliver this report because I, I, I think it's going to um, serve as a model for, for how my reports will be moving forward. Um, my team of advisors, which is to say my teacher education advisor, Julie Pittman, um, workforce advisor, Christy Van Auken, and principal advisor, Tabari Wallace, and I have, uh, along with Freebird McKinney, have put... Um, a lot of effort into um, deciding where we are going to go on school visits and what what uh, what we are going to to see, um, and we're doing so in a way that really encourages districts to just let us come and see what they've got going on, rather than um, uh, asking them to kind of put on a show for us, so to speak. Um, we we want to see districts warts and all. Um, but that said, we have seen some amazing things. Um, next slide, please. Um, that <clears throat> really go to, to to speak about this administration's North Star, which is that every student deserves a highly qualified, excellent teacher in every classroom. And I'm thrilled to say that that uh, I'm going to share um, examples of that this morning. So um, go, we'll go ahead and go to the next slide. Thank you. So it's been um, I, I about, I, about six weeks since we um, went to Lexington City Schools, we visited all six of the schools that are part of Lexington City Schools. Um, most of those schools are leader in me schools. And so we were greeted by student ambassadors who um, led us around the school. Um, 
And really what, what we saw in Lexington City Schools was an incredible amount of student agency. Um, a lot of student empowerment and opportunities for students to lead. And of course, this goes, you know, this starts in elementary school with Leader and Me schools. And so you can imagine that by the time these students um, become um, teenagers, they are um, really in incredible at taking responsibility for their own learning. Um, we met with the mayor of Lexington, um, Mayor Clark, who shared with us that the government leadership there in Lexington City really set out to partner with the school district. See, they had an issue and their issue was that their elected school board did not reflect the community at large. And so they actually set out to diversify their school board. And as a result, their local board is now representative of their student population. They also, um, I would say something that sets them apart is their ability to partner um, local businesses with the school community when it came to development going on in the community. Um, they've, they've got a lot of partnerships um, with businesses as well as the YMCA, and it's just a very future forward model of what um, a community partnership with a school looks like. Um, after that visit, we went to the Western region of the state. This, this visit encompassed two things. Um, the first was that we, we started in Cullowhee and um, had an opportunity to visit with the beginning teacher of the year cohort. So the beginning teacher of the year cohort, this, this is the second year that this award has been given, the BTOY. And there are three beginning teachers from each region who are part of the cohort. So there are pl plus three charters. So there are 27 of these beginning teachers of the year all together. And they were able to spend a week in Cullowhee doing their own professional development. And I got to spend some time with them at the at the end of that week. Um, what I heard from them was very interesting. We we heard everything from, oh my goodness, I, I'm so lucky that my first school turned out to be the school that I'm in because I'm so happy and I never want to leave my school. All the way to, I had teachers in tears saying, I'm not supported at my school. Um, I don't know what to do. Um, it's really hard to be a beginning teacher right now. And I'm sure that those of us who've taught can have just complete uh, empathy for, for beginning teachers during this pandemic. Um, I had the honor of speaking at, at the um, wonderful, wonderful ceremony um, at Western Carolina University um, for, for the BTOY. Uh, next slide, please. And the winner um, is Emily Higdon, who teaches in Macon County. And her BTOY colleagues just could not have been happier for her. Um, both the winner and the runner up are both from the Western region, actually. And this ceremony was um, incredibly special and just a way this the, the program and the ceremony itself are just incredible ways to show um, the impact that um, this program has on retaining beginning teachers, because in recognizing them for their leadership, they are now going to lead their fellow beginning teachers. And we know that's where our retention problems are the most challenging. We've got to retain our beginning teachers. So we moved on to the far west. We visited four counties in the, in the far west. Um, <clears throat> um, we visited an elementary school in Jackson County who has already been immersed in science of reading training for their teachers. 
Um, every um, literacy is embedded in every subject already, which is um, incredible to see. And we got to meet the incoming. They have a, an incredible incoming superintendent, Dr. Ayers, who is just going to be transformational in Jackson County. And we're really excited uh, for her to begin her tenure. Um, we went to Macon County next, and um, I got to visit the uh, uh, Nantahala School, which is one of three K-12 schools we have in the state. And um, if you've not heard the phrase geographically challenged before, you might not have been to Nantahala School. It sits on top of a mountain in the Nantahala Forest. Um, if it were not for this school's existence, students would have uh, about a two hour bus ride each way to go to their uh, closest school because of uh, the, the um, fact that you would be coming down a mountain for one. And also there's just not another school that's close. Um, so really it, that, that was just an incredible school. And what was really special is that um, the top picture is a picture of a, a girl giving a presentation on Amelia Earhart. And in that classroom, we saw um, a teacher who had created virtually an international experience <laughs> with schools across the world. So that this little school in the Nantahala forest at the top of a mountain could see what life is like across the world. It was really amazing. Um, we'll go on to Swain County, um, which is um, unique because similar to Polk County, which we've shared with you before, um, pre-K is not an add-on. Pre-K is embedded in the K-12 model, so they have a pre-K through 12 model where anyone who wants to go to preschool at the school can, can go. Um, and they are a leader in the um, district, and this actually starts, the leader in me principles actually start with the pre-K students. And um, I have to say, if you ever need a, a shot in the arm when you're having a bad day, visiting a pre-K classroom will, will give you that shot in the arm. Um, we also saw a, um, uh, a greenhouse th through an ag program at one of the high schools uh, where they actually this greenhouse is open to the public and students help run the greenhouse and it raises thousands of dollars for this um, ag program every year and the kids get real life experience running the greenhouse. Um, we also had the privilege to have lunch prepared for us by the junior chef program. Um, they had earned third place in the state finals and um, it's always a treat to have someone else cook for you. And um, I can definitely say that um, having the watching these students serve us after preparing all of this food was just uh, incredible. Really, really a treat. Um, then in in Haywood County, um, we saw this is actually I'm holding a bull's eye, not a bull's eye, but an actual bull's eye. And um, that took me back to my uh, high school biology days. I can tell you that. Um, so it was you can kind of see the reaction of the girl <laughs> sitting next to me. But um, yeah, we were dissecting bull's eyes. Um, we saw a lot of hands on learning a lot. Uh, one of the things that I always look for going back, this goes back to my days as a consultant, um, is when you walk into a room, is every student engaged? It's really hard to engage every single student in a class, but but we, we saw that in, in many of these classrooms where every, and, and we're talking 16 and 17 year olds, where every single student is doing what they're supposed to be doing willingly and um, just cannot say enough about, about that school.
Um, in McDowell County, we also saw pre-K programs. We saw dual language immersion. That was incredible. This is a group of student ambassadors in this picture who, again, um, showed us around. I, I can't explain to you um, how incredible it is when you walk into a building and the students greet you, the students tell you how it's going to be, the students lead the way. It is absolutely something that, um, I mean, each of these students were each individuals in their own right and um, each took a different approach to, to leading the way. And um, um, the way that they each could talk about their school was absolutely mind blowing. And the information that they had about their, they were docents for their school. Um, it was absolutely incredible. Then um, we took a, a separate trip to Rutherford County where we met first with a, um, a group of community partners. So Rutherford County has been very intentional about the way they leverage community partnerships. Um, every seventh through 12th grader in Rutherford County has a community mentor, every single one. And this is through an organization called the McNair Foundation, um, which is from a community member who endowed this, this foundation to the community. Um, one or more adults for every single middle and high school student, one more adult invested in the long and, and short term and long term success of every child is just incredible. They also in this district, what we learned was that they are very intentional about identifying teachers who they feel would make good administrators. We've all heard the, you know, just because you're a great teacher doesn't mean that you're going to be a great administrator. Um, but um, they are, are very intentionally um, work with teachers who um, will, will make great, great uh, school principals. And then they find a way to pay for the uh, education for that teacher leader. So, um, a couple of weeks ago, we went all the way to the southeast region of the state. Um, I love this picture right here because this is a picture of my dad and me talking with Daniel Scott, who is um, uh, this year the, the outgoing regional teacher of the year. And it's special to me because um, when I was growing up, my father was a high school band director. My father's still at 75 as teaching music um, full time uh, in middle school or actually grades four through eight. Um, I've said it before and I'll say it again. There's a special place in heaven for people who teach children how to play instruments. Um, and he's been doing this for 54 years, and I think he's going to die with a baton in his hand. Um, he came with me on this visit, and um, we got to see some incredible things. It, Daniel Scott is one of those people who could, you could put him in any classroom and he would be an amazing teacher. I mean, but to watch him teach music was just a thing of beauty. Um, so, um, I will share on a side note that we we saw a lot of incredible things and my father on the drive back said, you know what? I think I'm going to go back and start integrating STEM into my music lessons. And I said, dad, do you even know what STEM is? And he, he did and he learned a lot. And even at 75 is, is still learning and, and just is such an inspiration to me. Um, we saw a lot of incredible things uh, on this trip. Um, not the least of which was the Southeast Regional Skills Center. Um, this is a skill center that pulls from, it's located in Onslow, but it pulls from Duplin and Jones County as well. And students come and um, get trained. I mean, we saw a, an automotive shop that was, looked like something out of the future. And I actually saw a car get its wheels aligned through the computer. It was absolutely amazing. Um, 
And uh, we also um, saw um, an incredible professional kitchen and the students prepared shrimp and grits for us for lunch that is, was hands down the best shrimp and grits I have ever had. It was absolutely amazing. Um, the other really interesting thing about, um, sorry, Deanna, the other real quick, the other interesting thing is that the, um, this district has already begun science of, of science of reading training as well with letters. And the teachers who have uh, participated and led that effort sat down with us to talk about their journey. And we are learning from, from what they have been doing um, for the, the past school year. And um, they are training right now over 350 teachers in letters. Um, and they are going to be part of our communication plan to share what the legislation, what the legislature has mandated uh, for all pre K through fifth grade teachers in North Carolina, which is um, science of reading training using letters. And then finally, um, last week, I believe it was last week, uh, the chair and I and others actually um, visited some schools in Charlotte Mecklenburg and I touched on one thing we saw yesterday that we're going to bring back to you in June. Um, but we also visited um, Governor's Village STEM Academy, uh, which is a magnet school. Um, and um, this this was a very interesting school. This used to be two different schools that served two very different communities and the schools have merged and now this is the largest K-8 school in the state. Um, and it, um, the principal at the school, Principal Garcia, was just a force of nature. She actually goes into the community and recruits people to come and work in the district and then help them get their teaching degree. And so she is literally growing her own in her K through eight school. Um, it was an incredible, incredible visit. And you can see some of the scholars here um, who um, uh, ushered us around the building that day. Um, but again, they embed literacy into every subject that they do. And we are really starting to see a theme emerge across the state um, with successes in schools that are that are taking this approach to literacy. So finally, my team and I have been discussing what we call the now what. So, you know, my my pet peeve is we 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 go to districts, we see amazing things. We talked about this yesterday. We see pockets of excellence, but then we kind of look at our at our data and our numbers of things in this in, in the aggregate statewide. Um, or we break them down into subcategories and are are rightly so not happy with what we see. How can we scale up the pockets of excellence that we're seeing? Um, and so my, my team and I are right now working to figure out how we can leverage the expertise of what we see across the state. For example, I've, I've spoken about how we're going to ask um, Onslow County to help us um, work with teachers to understand what science of reading training is, et cetera. But you know, we, we're, we're going to leverage the expertise of the executive director of the McNair Foundation, and then we're going to link her um, up with other communities that might not have something like that so that they can learn how their community can support kids through mentorship or, or some other way. Um, but we, we are committed to working out how we are going to take what we see in here and improve outcomes for all kids. So thank you for the opportunity to, to share what we've been doing and um, cannot wait to share more with you in June. Superintendent Truett, any questions or comments for the superintendent, Mr. Ford? 
Thank you, Superintendent. I just wanted to note for the record that I'm a governor's uh, village parent. Uh, my son, you actually spoke to his class and he's pretty jazzed up. Uh, he said, Dad, do you know who Superintendent True it is? I said, I believe that I do. <laughs> So, uh, as a major way across the state, I just wanted to let you know that uh, not only did you touch my territory, you literally touched my backyard. Although he's virtual, uh, 100% virtual, he was uh, pretty excited about that. Well, so I went into, I, I may have been in, I may have seen him on the screen. I did not know that your son went there, but we did go into a room with a very dynamic teacher who had all of the kids on the big screen and he was engaging each and every one. And um, uh, that that your your son's very fortunate to attend TV because it's it was a very special place. So thank you for sharing. Any other comments, Mr. Chairman Wendell, Mr. Hall. Thank you, sir. Uh, good morning to all and uh, to the superintendent. Uh, my question is, uh, what's the process to? Uh, to invite you and the team to come to a individual uh, school or region, uh, I just I just like to know what, what's the process. Is it is it metrics that's developed in, in Raleigh uh, for your visit, or is it just a invitation from the uh, school system itself? So um, it's I've been invited to go to all of those places. Um, and basically what happens is, um, a couple of times I, someone will email me directly, Mr. Hall and say, we want you to visit. And I forward that email to Mrs. Julie Pittman and they put it, they work with, um, my wonderful executive assistant Marge, uh, to figure out where, where there's an opening. And then we start building out a visit to a region. And so if there is a specific place that you would like for me to go, just send me an email and we'll make it happen. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Dr. Oxendine. Thank you so much, uh, Superintendent Truett, for that fine report. I want to offer a suggestion, if I may. Um, in the western part of the state, we have the um, we have the um, Kuala Boundary, which is our only federal um, tribe of Indians. And that covers three counties. So I was thinking there, that school it doesn't belong to us. I mean, we have no governance over the the that's a BIA school governed by the Bureau of Indian Affairs. But some of the Native American students do attend those three counties, those three mm -hmm. school districts. And I'm thinking, wouldn't it be a great idea when you're out west again to go visit those schools? It's uh, Swain, Graham. And oh, the third escapes me. Hey, hey, what I believe it might be. Jackson, 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 those three counties. Mm -hmm. So it might be a good idea when you're ever out west again to um, pay a visit into one of those schools, elementary, high school, and so we and, and work with the um, the Eastern Band of Cherokee. Spend some time chatting with them, the yeah. students here. So um, last over the summer, I went to the to the boundary and um, met with leadership and um, uh, took a tour of, of the boundary itself and uh, look forward to, saw, saw their amazing high school and football field and can't wait to go back. School. It is. Mr. Bristow Smith. Just a, a quick remark and that is that um, one of the things I'm grateful for is that I, I do follow the agencies and um, superintendents trips across the state on Twitter. And so appreciative yeah. that you know, your trips are, are very quickly elevated on Twitter and we see the pictures and we hear updates. Um, feels almost like we're kind of surrogately uh, traveling with you. <laughs> I think I just made that adverb up, but um, I can do that, right? So um, anyway, just thank you for uh, for pushing that out there on social media and, um, and and sort of flipping the script a little bit instead of having these counties come to you and present to you here in Raleigh, you, you getting out of Raleigh and going to the county that's really powerful, sends a message statewide, um, and, and we hear that. And so I, I do enjoy all these Twitter updates. Well, thanks. And and um, I know how hard it is for principals to get out of the building, and you're already overcommitted, I'm sure, by being on the state board, but you are welcome, and any advisors are welcome to travel with us anytime. And and, and Maureen has, thankfully. We're, we're always thrilled when Maureen comes and, and adds her perspective. And we... We learned yesterday there's podcasts being developed. 
Uh, would you want yes. to comment on that? Yes. Um, so as part of our, uh, we, so we're in the process of developing a teacher council. Um, and then, and then from that will follow a principal council, but, uh, we're starting with the teacher council that will, um, allow us to elevate, continue to elevate teacher voice the way we try to on social media and try, try to call out students and, and teachers. Uh, but we want a more formal structure, uh, with this teacher council, um, that, um, will allow us to share. The things that don't necessarily make it into the media or, or earn an award or, or something like that. Um, uh, and, and we, we want to be part of the solution of developing teacher leaders. And we're hoping yeah. that our, our, our blog and our podcast will, will be able to do that. Any other comments? Thank you. Superintendent Cook got report. That one thing I'd add is your visits to these schools uh, give us great opportunities to learn from where the innovation is happening, as well as to celebrate the excellence that's occurring in our schools and often to flip the script on how public schools in North Carolina describe. So we appreciate that leadership on your part and the highlighting the great work that's going on in North Carolina public schools. Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay, team, at this time, we'll, we'll go back in our agenda to um, our partners with ABC Collaborative and uh, here to provide us a initial report on their work at Drs. Benjamin and Zimmerman. Uh, thank you. Are you all able to hear me? Yes, we sure can. Thank you, sir. Uh, uh, Dr. Zimmerman's, I think, uh, attending in the pediatric intensive care unit today, so it'll be just me. I'm Distinguished professor of pediatrics and uh, on faculty at Duke with a joint appointment at UNC Chapel Hill. This is a, a collaboration between UNC Chapel Hill and is now uh, a national program. And this part of the program is uh, related to North Carolina's Plan A. Go ahead, next slide, please. So, just some definitions to get everyone on the same page. Uh, community transmission. I have uh, four sons. If my eighth grader develops uh, COVID-19 here at the house, and then um, uh, before he develops symptoms, he goes to school. Uh, if he were to then infect somebody, he would have a primary case. Uh, he got it at home. That would be a community transmission. If he went to school asymptomatic, gave it to somebody else, that would be a within school transmission. That's clearly what we want to prevent is the within school transmission. We don't want children and adults getting COVID as a result of going to school. We differentiate between community transmission and within school transmission by contact tracing. So that is school staff and the local health department and partnership uh, go through and contact everyone who came in close contact with uh, the children or adults involved and their family members and set up a timeline of when symptoms and positive tests occurred and can determine which cases are community transmission and which are within school transmission. In some infectious diseases, contact tracing can overestimate uh, work-related or school-related transmission. Sometimes contact tracing can underestimate, and sometimes contact tracing um, gets it very, very close to correct. Uh, based on some data just published, um, I'll give you what it is for COVID-19 when we review the Utah data. Schools can differentiate between extracurricular activity and whether it was in the classroom. Go ahead, next slide, please. And I'll review genome-wide sequencing when I go over the Utah data. Now, as you all know, from August 2020 uh, to October, we had over 90,000 students and staff and in-person instruction that were part of the ABC 11. Those districts uh, uh, agreed to prospectively determine uh, infections and in real time on a weekly basis, those superintendents met with us whenever there were infections, they provided solutions and the faculty gave input to those solutions, but those were solutions that your superintendents came up with in responses to some of the infections that they were seeing. We also had um, free consultative service for hundreds of school meetings, one-on-one -on -one calls with superintendents, and um, we do not take uh, resources from the schools. We've never been paid for the work. 
up until um, the grant that the state um, generously provided. And although those tax dollars pay for this work, um, uh, it's just important for me to note that the uh, faculty get um, zero dollars from that. Those dollars go to um, support the staff. Um, in those, in the fall, there were um, 805 infections in those uh, 11 school districts. There were 32 within school transmission. Over 3,000 close contacts were quarantined for those 32 infections. A secondary attack rate of approximately just under 1%. So transmission is very uncommon if we adhere to the mitigation strategies in North Carolina. Uh, the cases that we did have were in the unmasked setting. So in pre-K, there were a few children who were unmasked. There was a little cluster at lunch and in some of the next special needs classrooms. Go ahead, next slide, please. Those data were uh, then um, discussed and uh, at the state level. And one of the criticisms of the of the, the ABC data were we did not do testing of every individual. And did contact tracing underestimate how much secondary transmission was happening? Um, the methods were validated by the state of Utah. Um, they have testing uh, uh, routinely of all students out there. And in 20 elementary schools, they actually did genome-wide sequencing. So they can, if I come in uh, with COVID-19, I sit uh, next to um, a school teacher, I've got uh, a virus. If that school teacher also tests positive, we can do genetic analysis to see if that is actually the same virus genotypically, or if perhaps I got the virus at home and that teacher got the virus at home. We know from the Utah data two things. First of all, the Utah data were very consistent with North Carolina, where the secondary attack rate was 0.78%. Um, uh, so right around 1%, which is what we saw in North Carolina. And it also validated the use of contact tracing as a reasonable estimate of how much within school transmission is occurring. And it gives us confidence in the North Carolina data. Go ahead, next slide, please. Now, the transmission risk is very low with masking. Uh, so in North Carolina, that's been replicated in Utah, in Missouri, in Wisconsin, in Georgia, in Mississippi, in Western Europe, in Asia, Australia. Uh, it's a low, schools are a low risk environment if there is high fidelity to masking. It's high risk of transmission if we're not masked, uh, as evidenced by Florida, Tel Aviv, um, some mass breaks that were taken in uh, Georgia. Uh, and in a school wrestling tournament that uh, was published in the MMWR. Um, go ahead, next slide, please. <clears throat> now, in the winter surge uh, in North Carolina, these data were shown to DHHS, DPI, um, and um, legislators from both sides of the aisle um, you know, between October of 2020 and February of 21. We again took the ABC 11 and two additional school districts joined them. These data are getting ready to be submitted for peer review, um, but the results were very compelling. Despite rates of five, four to 500 per 100,000 per seven days, or nearly 100 new cases per day per 100,000 people, these school districts did a phenomenal job. You can see the primary cases in the fourth column and the secondary or within school transmission in column five, only 212 secondary cases, despite over 4,000 community cases that came into the schools. Now, there are two or three things that came from this um, that prompted some of the details of the, of the ABC Plan A uh, project. And that is, you can see school districts 10, 11, and 12, they're, um, uh, they're large school districts in the state of North Carolina. Uh, that's the number of students that were attending in person. And although all three school districts did well, you can see school district 10 has more infections than 11, 12, or 13, despite um, sometimes similar numbers of primary infections. So despite this being a very successful school district in just about any other state in the country, this particular school district wanted to improve. They put some process improvement in place, and they've since brought their within school transmission down. So this feedback to school districts and allowing them to compare to each other metrics was part of the reason that the uh, legislature put in, in place this program that I'm presenting to you today. You can see also that the high school transmission, these are typically, these were for the most part indoor sports. 
for a high fraction, approximately 75% of the within school transmission in high schools. However, that uh, transmission rate, even in indoor sports, uh, was uh, reasonably low. Um, go ahead, next slide, please. So it's with that that uh, we go into uh, plan A uh, for middle school and high school uh, for uh, North Carolina school districts and charters. 99 school districts, uh, excuse me, uh, LEAs are uh, participating, and I'm sorry for my casual language, uh, and 20 uh, charter schools are in uh, plan A. Now, as anticipated, there is, this is the first month of data that have come back. So this is a data cut from mid-March to April 23rd uh, in order to give um, time to um, uh, submit the report in writing on April 30th. Um, we're continuing to collect data in real time every week. The schools uh, upload uh, data into the Duke system uh, every Friday afternoon. But based on the April 23rd cut point, there were 2,200 uh, community acquired cases and very limited transmission, 42 cases of within school transmission across 751 schools. These schools are doing a great job. And if they follow the DHHS uh, Strong Schools Toolkit and adhere to the mask mandate, uh, they effectively mitigate within school transmission. This puts North Carolina really as a leader uh, across the United States in that uh, our schools are able to be in school full time. Our children and adults are safe from COVID in school. Uh, and, we, uh, and we have the data from that now to show that. And uh, we've got a couple other things in mind. We can compare school districts to one another whenever any of these school districts get outside of the second standard deviation. We also can see that um, transmission does not vary with the number of children per bus seat. So that was one of the concerns that a lot of folks had was, gosh, these children are gonna be riding sometimes for a long distance on, on buses. Uh, you know, maybe it's one child, two child, three children per seat. That does not seem to predict infection at all. The other thing is that there is no greater transmission in plan A than transmission in plan B. Now this is really dependent on the masking. But with masking, plan A transmission appears to be similar to transmission in plan B. Go ahead, next slide please. Most of the breakthroughs, by the way, of those 40 some odd breakthroughs, um, early analysis looks to be, they were related to MAC breaks and mask compliance. Now here, uh, this slide here is just to show you that the difference between small, medium, and large schools, uh, school, excuse me, LEAs, uh, you know, there's not really, we're not really seeing a difference there. Uh, secondary transmission in the number of children per bus seat. Again, we're not seeing a difference uh, in within school transmission there. Uh, go ahead, next slide, please. So interim summary data and conclusions. In the math on math setting, transmission is extremely low and the secondary attack rate is 1% or less. North Carolina has a mass mandate and the school districts are clearly enforcing it as evidenced by their success. Breakthroughs are almost uh, always related to mask, uh, lack of masking. Uh, this has uh, been shown uh, throughout the fall and the winter through the ABC 11 and also now across the broader range of LEAs and charter schools participating in this. Um, these breakthroughs, um, you can see the, the, the list, uh, you can see the list there. And thus, uh, there's not, there, there may be all kinds of reasons to support uh, plan B as opposed to plan A uh, for these uh, LEAs that are, that are continue to be in plan B. And I'm not expert in any way in any of those other reasons, but from a medical safety uh, uh, reason related to COVID, there's no medical safety reason to support plan B compared to plan A, provided that the LEAs continue to uh, adhere to the uh, to the mass mandate. Uh, and with that, I, I think that that is my last slide. Thank you, Dr. Benjamin. Any questions from my colleagues for uh, Dr. Benjamin on this interim report? Mr. Harold, Wendell. Mr. Hall. Thank you. 
Uh, Dr. Benjamin, I just wanted to make sure I'm hearing you uh, correctly. Uh, the one thing that uh, is, is is helping or, or reducing the transmission is the mask wearing. Yes, sir. In schools, I mean that's a that's a no-brainer. Am I correct? Yes, sir. These districts did not make uh, the ABC 11, and uh, then the two that joined them uh, did not make uh, substantial uh, overhauls uh, on a widespread basis as it relates to many of the other uh, mitigation strategies that have been proposed. Um, you know, there's been a smattering of changes inconsistently with ventilation throughout the state. There's been a smattering of testing. Um, DHHS has gotten a pilot program off the ground. It's a very nice little pilot program they've got going, but we're not seeing, you know, it's not like every school child is getting tested all the time, but the mass mandate uh, without, um, uh, without doubt, <clears throat> uh, you know, my training is in both epidemiology where I have a PhD and infectious disease uh, for my MD training. Uh, the mass mandate and its adherence in North Carolina uh, has been crucial uh, part of the Safe Schools Toolkit. Okay, and you also mentioned about the number of students on a seat yes, and, tra and, and transporting that uh, with the mass, it makes no difference whether they are sitting next to one another with four on the seat or three or even coming from the same family. Am yes, I correct? Sir. Yes, sir. And that's consistent with what we've seen in medical care. Um, you know, if you go for routine medical care and you go to the doctor, you'll be wearing a cloth mask or a medical mask. The physician or nurse or phlebotomist or respiratory tech, they'll be wearing in routine medical care, a medical mask with loops around the ear, not an N95. And uh, we do not see uh, uh, healthcare transmission Throughout 2020, this was before we were vaccinated, and we get a heck of a lot closer to you uh, than you do teaching algebra, and every bit as close to you when we listen to you with the stethoscope or draw blood from you as two children on a, on a school bus. Okay. And my last question is, and it's, it's not a part of your uh, presentation today, uh, hearing a, a more and more now about uh, swabbing kids periodically as they come in with the cheek swab to detect whether or not uh, they have, how effective or is that something just out there? Can you talk a little about that? Yes, sir. There are 347 different tests uh, that are granted an emer emergency use authorization. That number is probably in the 350s now. That, that number that I quoted to you is about two weeks out of date. There's about 350 tests that are approved, many of them rapid. A lot of them can be swabs. It's a little bit higher quality to swab just inside the nares, typically, than, than inside the buccal mucosa or inside the cheek. Not always the case, but typically those are a little bit higher accuracy. You can do those tests. The benefit of those tests to reduce transmission really has not been shown yet, but widely thought to be helpful, but hasn't been proven in the within school setting. It is very effective for you to determine if your mitigation measures are working. That's a very good use of, of testing. And a great place to do potentially to do testing is in the students and teachers who are unvaccinated and exposed to someone who's infected. That's a fantastic place to do testing to reduce the uh, length, potentially reduce the length of quarantine. And we are looking at that very question in collaboration with DHHS and some schools in Durham charter schools and some schools in Iredell Statesville, the entire school district of Iredell Statesville uh, is participating with us on uh, that, that project that they wanted our help with. They drove that project down there. They were um, instrumental in the design of that project, and it's to help their kids. That's an outstanding use of testing right there. And also, uh, you know, even though we want to identify as many 
uh, individuals as possible who's carrying the virus, but it also adds a level of comfort to our teaching staff. Yes, sir. So screening can be, um, has been employed throughout the country and at some schools in North Carolina, uh, the screening testing, which is just taking a subset of children and adults in the building and testing them on a regular basis, say 10% of your school population. That's been used in school districts throughout the country to, as you say, increase confidence for families and for staff around the safety of the school environment. Uh, and it, it has been used as a tool to increase attendance. And there are school districts throughout the country that have shown success in encouraging a higher fraction of people to come to the building face to face. So again, very good point on your behalf. Uh, that um, uh, that uh, that's another good use, uh, potential good use of testing. Thank you so much, Dr. Benjamin. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Hall. Um, in the interest of time, we'll continue with our COVID-19 update. Uh, thank you, Mr. Benjamin, for your report, Dr. Benjamin, and we look forward to uh, additional reports from you and your colleagues. Yes, sir. Thank you. We'll now move to our uh, partners in the Department of Health and Human Services, beginning with the Chief Deputy, uh, Gail Perry. Chief Deputy, welcome. Good morning, Chairman Davis. Good morning, Superintendent Truitt and members of the board. As always, uh, glad to be with you today to provide some what I hope will be briefer updates uh, today. I'm going to talk briefly about case rates overall and uh, clusters and then turn it over to Dr. Tilson, who will talk about an update on screening testing and spend most of the time on vaccines, particularly in light of the most recent announcement of the availability of uh, the Pfizer vaccine for 12 to 15 year olds. So let me move quickly into just some broad overview on where we are as a state in terms of cases that so we can move to the next slide. So I think the good news here is that case rates are continuing uh, to stabilize and we've seen a, a, a nice decline in cases among the 18 to 24 year old group after um, a sharp increase that we saw briefly. So those, those rates are stabilizing. So across the board in all age groups, uh, we do have relatively stable case rates and percent positives at this time. Next slide. Uh, as, as has been consistent throughout the pandemic, it is older youth that drive case rates among the, the zero to 17 year olds. I've shown this slide before, but this again just shows you um, where the majority of case rates are for, for children. Next slide, please. Uh, I did wanna highlight, and this was uh, referenced in, in the last presentation from our partners at the ABC Collaborative, uh, we are starting to see uh, more proportion of, of clusters associated with athletics. So I just wanted to highlight this. This is a good area again for some of that screening testing that I know Dr. Tilson will talk about, but did want to highlight that again, when we, when we think about teams, of course, that's folks up close and personal and I uh, did want to highlight that we have been seeing a, a greater proportion of our clusters uh, linked to athletics. And with that, I am going to quickly turn it over to Dr. Tilson to talk about uh, our testing pilot and the expansion that we are planning together. Dr. Tilson. Thank you. Good morning. Happy to be with you all as, as always. And again, yeah, we're going to be very brief because we really want to tell all that time for the great uh, information Dr. Benjamin was able to, to share. So we'll be uh, a brief update on topics that we had spent more time in depth in prior meetings. Um, just a couple slides on the update of our screening testing pilot. Again, that was part of that conversation that, that we just had on an, another layer of uh, protection and mitigation um, and, and the utilization of, of screening tests. We've brought this up at prior meetings, just wanted to give you an update on that. Um, so now currently in across North Carolina, uh, there's a testing pilot going on in 23 public schools, 25 charter, and seven private schools. 
um, on those pie charts, you'll see a breakdown of um, urban versus rural. So actually the majority in our rural schools, which is really exciting to see. Also looking through um, with an equity lens, testing in communities that have what uh, is turned a high social vulnerability index and so making sure we're getting those vulnerable communities. So we're having pretty good representation across across those communities. And then you can see the race ethnicity breakdown as well, just making sure that we are um, having our, our testing strategy have an equitable um, rollout. So just wanted to be sure you knew um, some of the data on how many schools are um, involved. On the next slide, please. Just a little bit of an update on some of the funding. We had brought this before, um, made you aware of this, but the CDC has announced the availability of federal funding um, to support this ongoing screening testing. We have submitted that request to the CDC um, and we'll be submitting a budget for that in, in June. Um, we'll also, one of the things that we heard from a lot of our school systems was the operational piece and the list of this was, was a lot for the schools. So what, uh, another thing that we'll be doing as part of this is we've issued an RFP, a request for proposals for a statewide vendor who could really support that end-to-end -end screening testing um, for schools or with schools, so that wouldn't all the the operation logistics wouldn't have to be um, uh, borne by the school, and we could bring an end an end and uh, vendor that could that could uh, work with all those logistics. Wouldn't it be required, but it would be an option um, for those school systems and communities that would want that extra layer of support. Um, and so that RFP is out. I don't want to say any more about that because we are in um, uh, procurement, but to know that that'll be an added support. The other pieces I wanted to point out is the use of those screening tests um, really dovetailed into some of the data that we had just talked about. So yes, we can use those tests for if somebody is sick, um, but the really nice piece of the screening test is to um, testing um, people without symptoms, that serial screening of people without symptoms, and then especially some of our schools are using it specifically within um, athletics and with sports teams. Again, that's where we're seeing some more of the cases, so thinking about doing that screening testing um, with in the athletes and with um, coaches and staff as well. And then some of our schools are also doing it around um, before prom or before graduation around special event, um, some screening testing um, as well. And we're providing ongoing technical um, support and office hours um, for those schools. And as we think about um, ending out the school year and heading into fall and summer, um, continuing to work with schools about um, uh, maybe expanding that as we open up to the next school year. Okay, next slide, please. And then just a little bit of a pivot to vaccines and where we are. Uh, this is our dashboard as of May 9th. I hope you're following um, daily um, our distribution. Uh, we are now more than 50% of our adult 18 and up um, have at least one vaccine, uh, one dose of vaccine, which we're very, very excited about. Um, and soon, probably in the next day or two, we'll hit the mark of 80% of our people um, uh, 65 and over um, being vaccinated. So that's really great news. And for those of you who follow a lot of our trends, we've had an enormous decline in our deaths, um, really with this high protection of some of our most vulnerable populations. So we're very excited about that. The other piece following along is we track week by week the age distribution of our vaccines. Um, and so we've had more than 43,000 16 and 17 year olds already vaccinated um, as we are expanding eligibility. So we're excited about that um, and having our adolescents starting to be um, vaccinated, at least our older uh, adolescents being vaccinated. On the next slide. There we go. Uh, this slide is outdated because we had to submit the slides Tuesday night, and we have some late breaking news from just last night, which I will verbally um, talk over. But I think many of you hopefully know that Pfizer was the vaccine that had already been authorized for our 16 and over. On Monday, the FDA expanded their emergency use author authorization um, to include people 12 and up. And then yesterday, the CDC has an advisory committee on immunization practice that also reviews the safety and efficacy data. Um, and then they went ahead and then also recommended the use um, in that age group 12 and up. So we're very excited about that. Um, and so last night, then we did push out a lot of the, um, the clinical guidance, updated our standing order, did all the things that we had to happen so that as of this morning, 
12 and up, um, can we can start uh, vaccinating 12 and up, which we're very, very excited about. There'd be a lot of different ways that um, families can have access to vaccine for their um, adolescents. One way is through our routine of uh, vaccinating providers on the next slide. Just want to be sure people are aware of how they can access the Pfizer for their patients or for their for their children. Excuse me. On the next slide. There we go. A couple different ways. Hopefully you're aware of that. We do have a vaccine um, help center people can call. We also have an online vaccine locator um, that we can go to. And on the next slide. Just want to make sure people know that you can um, filter. You can filter by your zip code, and then you can filter by vaccine type. So families can click Pfizer, and they can find out who, what vaccine provider near there, near them, have Pfizer um, in order to go ahead and either make an appointment or even do walk-ins. A lot of our providers have walk-ins. Can go ahead and start getting their adolescents um, vaccinated um, as well. So that's through our routine um, vaccinating providers. And on the next slide. Also, a lot of partnerships with schools. So, yay, on thinking through another easy point of access um, to vaccines for not just adolescents, but their families, for, uh, for school staff as well. Um, and so, we had sent out a survey with, um, in partnership with DPI. We're very grateful for that um, to a lot of our educational partners to understand their intent or what they were doing or how we could help facilitate any on-site vaccinations. We got responses back from almost 200 um, different um, school settings. Uh, more than a third of them had already begun or considering doing on-site um, vaccine access for students and staff and families. More than 50% had actually already identified a vaccine partner, which is great. Um, but also we, of those who hadn't, um, that uh, about another half were really interested in helping us do some of that matchmaking and linking them to a vaccine partner. You can see a lot of times it's our local health departments, but not always, sometimes hospitals, pharmacies, we can really link to any vaccine partner um, as well. Um, so we're really excited about that, and we will be reaching out to those, um, those schools and school systems and see how we can help to facilitate this as much as possible for that ready access. Some of the best practices that we're learning already is really, again, having it be open to families, to school staff, um, and a lot, actually, some of our, of our pediatricians that are starting to vaccinate also are, are um, increasing or are also uh, extending a vaccination to parents and to grandparents um, as that point of access to adolescents. And so we're very supportive of that and think that's really a great model. Um, okay, and that's it for us. We wanted to keep it very high level and brief, really wanted to give that weight of the time to our great partners at ABC to really show that really robust data. So with that, I will stop, and uh, we're happy to take questions as time allows, but I know that we're running a little bit over, so. Um, Dr. Tilson, Dr. Tilson, hey, it's Susan. Uh, but before we turn it to questions, I did just want to talk voice over just a, a few of the changes in the toolkit, as I know that is also on the agenda for readoption. So um, let me talk just briefly about those changes. The most substantive change, of course, is uh, the update regarding uh, not the no longer requiring the, outdoor face coverings, and that is in alignment with Executive Order 209. So that is definitely the most significant update. Uh, there are some other uh, smaller updates specifically around uh, updating to align with the CDC on routine cleaning and disinfection only after someone is sick or diagnosed with COVID-19. Uh, uh, we clarified the response to a person with symptoms as presumptive COVID-19 in the presence of a clinically compatible illness, if not tested. So there were some other smaller updates that were just to align with the CDC guidance, but the most substantive, of course, is the change in the requirement for outdoor mask wearing. So uh, with that, we are happy to answer any questions about the entirety of our presentation. Thanks. Oh, and, and Susan, thank you for, uh, for jumping in. And also, uh, you prompted me to remember one other piece of really, really important clinical consideration that came out late, late last night from the CDC as well that I meant to voice over, so thanks for that opportunity. The other uh, change in clinical guidance, which I think is going to be very important for our students, is um, that originally had been that uh, recommendation to not 
uh, what we say co-administer the COVID vaccine with other vaccinations and to wait at least 14 days before or after. Um, and uh, the uh, CDC then changed that guidance in looking through um, other data and past data from other vaccines and have now um, changed that, has said that you can also do a COVID vaccine with other vaccines either at the same time or um, close to it, which is really, really great news because as our providers are bringing our adolescents in for their COVID, they can also do updated vaccine um, if they need to. If some of our adolescents are behind on some of their regular vaccines, they can also go ahead and do them at that same visit, which will be really, really, really important um, to get all of our adolescents up to date on all of their routine um, vaccinations as well. So that was a really important clinical um, guidance change that happened just last night. So I just wanted to voice that over. Very good. Thank you for that update. And I'll remind my colleagues as part of our action agenda, we will um, consider ado adopting as been our practice, the updated strong schools toolkit for this presentation. Any questions or comments from my colleagues for uh, Chief Deputy Gail Perry or Dr. Tilson? Superintendent. Thank you so much, as always, for keeping us up to date and providing such clear information. I, I do have a question about um, masking in schools because I, I get so many emails from parents asking me this question. And that is what conditions need to be present in order for, especially given the, the data that uh, Dr. Benjamin shared today, what conditions need to be present in order for um, the masking order to be lifted in our schools? And does it, will it be different for elementary school than six to 12? Or are those conditions, do they need to be the same for the entire uh, K-12 population? Thank you for that question, Superintendent. Really appreciate it. And I, I, I agree. I think the, the prior presentation from the ABC collaborated really collaborative really reaffirmed, reaffirmed the effectiveness of mask wearing. And we, we are certainly considering that. And Dr. Tilson and our epidemiology team and medical team have been doing some 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 additional thinking on that. And Dr. Tilson, I'll turn it over to you to to sort of talk through where we are right now. Yeah, sure thing. So where we are right now, again, is that we know that that rate of transmission is higher in indoor versus outdoor settings. And I think you saw that, uh, heard that announcement from the CDC a week or two ago, which is why we felt comfortable lifting that outdoor mask um, mandate. We still know there are higher rates of transmission um, indoor. And then again, as you saw with Dr. Benjamin's presentation, the incredible protection of that indoor mask mandate. I think when we um, think through the, who are the populations in our schools, um, you know, predominantly, although it's great, great news that our 12 and up are eligible for vaccine, there's obviously a lot of people under age 12 that are in our school setting. So we're still going to be, for a while, predominantly unvaccinated students. And we see that strength of that mask mandate. So I think we're going to have to keep reassessing in terms of rate of spread and then rate of immunizations um, and then what the age of the immunizations is and thinking through where's that balance of the protection you get from immunization versus masks. So I think it's going to be a little, um, uh, I think we'll have to continue to iterate on this and thinking through what's the best mandate uh, for that mask mandate in school. I think it'll still be recommended. You can see that strength of data. I think masks in schools are gonna be a really good idea for a long time. But I think when we think through that mandate piece, we'll, I think we'll have to keep thinking through what's our rate of, of vaccination, what's our rate of viral spread, um, and, and make changes as we go along. Uh, Superintendent. Um, so is there a critical mass of uh, or a specific number in, uh, let's say, uh, uh, the K-5 population uh, that needs to be vaccinated in order for the need for a face covering to be eliminated. So I think this keeps running into, right, we keep saying this is an unprecedented um, pandemic, right? So we don't have any past data specifically on COVID with vaccination versus masking. So I think it is, it'll be hard to say today 
what would be that critical number for K-5 right now. So that's why, and continuing through all of our policies, it's been iterative understanding as we learn more, as we see our trends, we see the effect of vaccines. We haven't had any vaccines in the K-5 to right now, so it, I, I hesitate to say right now what is the exact metric for a population that we have no experience with right now in terms of um, understanding that spread and the effect of vaccines. So I think we'll just have to continue to, to iterate on that. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Deputy and Dr. Tilson for this report and your continued partnership. And we also want to express our appreciation to every principal, every teacher, every administrator that is continuing to prove that our schools are safe for our students to attend and learn from and continue to follow the protocols to ensure that they're safe. Thank you so much. Uh, team will now um, move to our legislative update and I'll call on Mr. McKinney for this item. Good morning, Chair Davis, Superintendent Truitt, Vice Chair Duncan, Lieutenant Governor Robinson, Treasurer Falwell, board members and advisors, as my colleagues here, the department and the board and our partners joined across the state in support of our North Carolina public schools. Thank you, Shire folk. We rejoice as we continue to rise from the challenges of COVID and as we elevate the transcendence of our collective efforts and dedication and commitment, I wanna say thank you. And while the last three days of the state board's May planning and work session has brought us all together for the first time since the life halting dawn of COVID, we have been called to our next endeavor, the recovery and transformation of North Carolina public schools moving forward. And as we go beyond normalcy, we accept the challenge imbued in the spirit of our mission to provide opportunity and access to all of our students, each and every, and as Dr. Jackson stated yesterday, all means all. I wanted to take a brief moment to say thank you to all of our district leadership and staff, our superintendents, our principals, our teachers for their inspirational year of navigating this unprecedented and turbulent waters of COVID. With an exemplary resilience and steadfastness and a model of hope and promise. Again, thank you. And as we look at the legislative update today, I ask that you continue your relentless support of our teachers, of our district, and of our schools as we align our legislative priorities with the board's strategic plan, with Superintendent Truett's Operation Polaris, and our constitutional duty to provide a sound and basic education. Our work continues, and we have miles to go before we sleep. As you can see from uh, this slide right here, uh, many of our colleagues over at the General Assembly have been deprived of that sleep. Uh, 1,690 bills have been filed, uh, 969 in the House, 729 in the Senate. There are 321 Ed bills uh, currently, of which as of this morning, so that, that number has changed, 102 have made crossover. So I'm going to do my best over the next uh, 10 minutes or so to try and highlight which of those bills I'd really like for you all to take a look at. And if I can provide any former, excuse me, any further assistance with my colleague, uh, Jamie Falkenberry, we will do that. Did want to make note the calendar flex bill, which uh, obviously there are more of those bills than any. Uh, many of those bills did make crossovers, so we'll see uh, how those fare. Uh, in their um, opposite uh, house, or excuse me, chamber. There is a link to the legislative update right there on um, the May 3rd edition. So uh, Ann Murtha and I continue to put those up on a bi-monthly basis. Again, just trying to keep you all in the public abreast of the changes that are happening uh, with, with many of these bills. Uh, the next two slides, you will see bills that have already been chaptered. So these are these are laws currently. Uh, we have provided uh, not only a link to the bill in and of itself, but also a bill summary. Uh, many of these, again, uh, over the last three months, these are very familiar to you, uh, particularly relief bill mods and, and also the Reopen Our Schools Act. But again, just wanted a quick and easy reference if you need to look back and see those bills that have been signed by the governor, what they represent. 
Um, th these next few slides, these are bills that are filed this week. So very new and recent bills. Um, some of them um, are quickly making, again, today is crossover day. So um, some of these, unfortunately, probably will, will not make that. But I did want to uh, bring some highlights, the, the turn high achiever, ach achieving students and the teachers. So you'll see several bills have been filed to help us with retention and recruitment. Um, the drive recommendations and teacher diversity bill was filed. Um, as was a bill that provides funds for school mental health support personnel and also an HBCU HMSI uh, teaching fellows expansion. So you can see, I think, of the bills that were filed this week, um, particularly teacher recruitment focus. And then at the top there on the right hand column uh, yesterday, also 946 was filed, which is sound basic education for every child. Um, again, we provided the links there for you to so that you can click on that. And there's also on that link an individual link to bill summaries if they are provided. Some of those are a little new right now, so there may not be a, a, a summary on there. Uh, if you flip to the next slide again, bills K, House uh, K-12 Ed bills that have uh, that have been moving this week. Um, uh, uh, House Bill 324. Uh, charter school omnibus eight seven two nine. Uh, that uh, crossover yesterday. Both of those bills did. Also, uh, House Bill eight twenty five, eight seventy eight. Uh, particularly eight seventy eight. Our team has been working on this one as it made crossover, and we'll hopefully also have some on the on the Senate side with that. That's the uh, schools for the deaf administration bill. If you flip to the uh, next slide, uh, Senate K-12 Ed Bills that moved this week. Uh, note uh, Senate Bill 582, the high school adjunct instructors and community college prep, special education due process hearings, and the statewide medical action plan for students. So um, please, if I can pervert, uh, provide further information or a brief synopsis of that, uh, reach out to me and I, and I will do that. And then these next few pages, we just wanted to provide you, a, again, a bulleted synopsis of major bills to watch. Uh, these were ones that we self-selected that would be um, definitely linked either to uh, the strategic plan or Operation Polaris, or we feel like we really just would like your voice in, in, uh, in either advocacy or if you do have some concerns on these bills. Um, education law changes. Uh, uh, House Bill 324, uh, 486, we're continuing to work on that one. Um, replace EOC with national assessment. That is also the one that um, ends work keys if, if that bill passes. So we've been working very intently with uh, Trey Michael's team um, on, uh, on what that, and, and excuse me, and Dr. Howard, uh, and, and what that bill may look like if that is uh, uh, signed as is. If you flip over 644, um, with remote academies, this is actually that the House bill dealing with remote academies. The Senate bill is 654, which um, we've also provided on here. That is the co uh, the K-12 COVID provision bill, which has a piece uh, of with academies in there. I think that's definitely another bill to watch and that we'll, we'll have that slide in a second. I'm very excited about House Bill 677, the School about Accountability Recommendations. Commission, um, this is echoing the superintendents, Operation Polaris and the working group, the testing and accountability working group, as well as uh, the strategic plan of the board uh, and, and looking at our testing and accountability practices uh, and, and any way that we can um, look at ways to transform that. Next page is a full breakdown of, uh, of Senate Bill 593, the special education's due process hearings. Um, we are uh, in continuing discussions on this bill as well as it has made crossover. So I'm um, definitely working with Senator Jackson's team and also um, looking at a meeting in next week with, with the House colleagues. 695 statewide medical action plan for schools. There's another a brief synopsis of that bulleted. Again, any of these bills that you feel like you'd like a little bit more information on, please reach out to, uh, to Mr. Falkenberry and I, we will provide that. And then uh, this is a slide we wanted to specifically highlight ones related to charter schools. Um, House Bill 729, that was the uh, one that made crossover last night. 
uh, House Bill 794, 825, and 911. So each one of those dealing specifically with uh, charter schools. And again, there's a, a link to the summary and to the bill in and of itself, and, a, and just a, a little synopsis there. If you flip over to uh, to the next slide, these this is the May legislative calendars. Uh, some of these are a little uh, outdated because of the the quick transformation that these bills are going through. So uh, that uh, the date may be a little off because there was a, a flurry of uh, actions that happened yesterday and the day before. Uh, but but as you can look through there, you'll see some of those that we've already highlighted there. But just wanted to kind of give you a sense of where that bill is currently. Continuing on the Senate side, bills that are uh, that are in uh, a committee of some sort. So this is the May legislative calendar. Many of these bills, particularly 582, 654, 695, have made crossover. So again, they are currently in the House now. And then lastly, just uh, further links to uh, the Senate Joint Appropriations, the Governor's Budget Recommendations. We will. Well, we are, but uh, very soon, particularly after crossover, uh, it will be dominated by budget discussions. So I will do my best to keep you guys up to date as as those uh, discussions are unfolding. Really hoping in the next couple of weeks to 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 see that budget uh, to fruition from the Senate side, and then the process. Then it would go to the House side. So the Senate kicks it off this this biennium. Now, a few more links uh, from the federal side on the American Rescue Plan Act. Uh, again, just using this as a reference point if you have questions about federal legislation. Uh, in the very, very last slide, uh, we wanted to continue to provide previous updates so you can see kind of the transitions as we've been moving. So those are, again, just a, a library of, of updating all the way back to um, when uh, I began this position, so you can just kind of see the flow of these presentations. Um, and also, you'll notice that today we're not doing the community affairs update, so that will be um, every other month now, uh, following up the superintendent's uh, presentation today. Uh, and so, for time's sake, we will we will do that in June. So, uh, any any questions or um, anything that I can uh, help further with or highlight and. Again, probably for time's sake, if, if you wanted to send an email on any of these specifically, or if, if I can help right now, great. Questions from my colleagues, Mr. McKinney. Um, this is Mariah Morris, and I have a comment and question. Ms. Morris. Um, thank you for all of that information, Freebird. Yes, ma'am. Um, and this is really for the whole board, not just for Freebird. But um, on Monday, we heard from Dr. Hole from NASB. Um, and his words really resonated with me about how we're living in this legacy moment um, where we have the time and resources to really reimagine our public education spaces. And he also called on the State Board of Education to understand our power of policy, the power of question, and the power to convene. And my comment today is going to focus on using the State Board's collective voice to utilize the power to question. Um, I think Dr. Hull's point about having this power to question really reminds me of the famous quote by Franklin D. Roosevelt, great power involves great responsibility. And on this call and in this room lies great power. Um, in this legislative presentation by Freebird, we heard a lot about legislation that if passed is gonna really directly input or impact our students and teachers daily lives in our public schools two specific bills that will directly impact the day-to-day -day details of our teachers and student lives are House Bill 755, focusing on academic transparency, and House Bill 324, focusing on teachers' approach to teaching about racism and sexism. I ask that the board pause and reflect on these two bills, utilizing some of the details from Dr. Hull that he noted in his opening presentation. At the core of both of these bills reflects a distrust of our public school teachers. And I ask that we pause to stop and question these two bills and think about how the state board can utilize a collective voice to either affirm or question these two pieces of legislation. Dr. Hull notes that as a public board, we have to use data and evidence to drive this power of 
of question. And to that point, I asked, do we have data and evidence to suggest that teachers are engaging in indoctrination that needs to be checked by potential state law? On the district voices tour that we've noted does an amazing job of getting out in the field. What examples of indoctrination are y'all seeing that would lead to the support of these bills? On these tours, what conversations with teachers and school leaders have you heard that support the need for this legislation? And I bring forth these questions because my public school experience that spans approximately 15 years leads me to believe that teachers instruct, we lead, we love, and we care for our students, but we don't indoctrinate our children. And I also find that teachers already disseminate information to parents and families through weekly, weekly newsletters, online learning platforms, open houses, curriculum nights, and many other ways. And our teachers are professionals who are trained and hold great professional expertise. And I find these two bills to be counterproductive and directly challenge our board's strategic plan. And I ask us to utilize that power of questioning and the great responsibility in this room. And I ask you to hold the line for our public schools. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Morris. We, as always, we greatly appreciate your advocacy and advice. And we'll take your comments this morning, as well as what we heard yesterday and the previous day in our planning and work session under advisement as we consider all opportunities to partner with the General Assembly. Any other questions or comments for Mr. McKinney? I have a quick question. Dr. Oxendine. Thank you, uh, Chair Davis, and thank you for that update. Mr. McKinney, my question has to do with the, um, uh, and it looks like the bill contains a lot of specificity. So it gives me the impression that this is down the pipe somewhere. Um, it has to do with, um, so I'm so sorry. Adding a segregation core score to the school report cards. So, if you could talk about that again, and my, I guess my question is if this should pass and it will make its way over to the department, to the state board for some work around that policy wise and then some implementation touches. So, what could you give me a little bit, a little bit of background on this? Because in the back of my mind, I'm seeing maybe additional report guard card could be coming out of this. Yeah, if you would give me the opportunity, that bill was filed this week, so that's a newly filed bill to really look through that and then have a conversation with you and then and, and provide you some uh, synopsis of that. I, I'd appreciate that. That sounds good. I, I do not want to comment on that without kind of having the bill in front of me and just make sure that my interpretation of it and the interpretation of of our colleagues here have a, a good understanding of that, but I would love to follow up with that you if you would if you would allow me. That would be great because I'm I'm in my mind I'm thinking about the Office of Civil Rights, the Department of Education, the U.S. Supreme Court, a lot of things. So that would be good. A little additional info. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. And if Mr. Kenny, if you wouldn't pro mind providing that update to all of board members, that would be most helpful. I will do that. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. I'm sure there's other questions since there's such a heavy volume of activity that Mr. McKinney and Mr. Falkenberry are shepherding for us with the General Assembly. So I just invite my colleagues to contact our fine legislative liaison staff with additional questions and insights, and I'm sure they'll keep us informed as the work moves along. So thank you, Mr. McKinney. Thank you. Uh, team will now proceed to our committee reports and I remind committee chairs in the audience that all voting on consent and any item requiring action will be done at the end of the uh, meeting via roll call vote. We'll now proceed to the Education Innovation and Charter Schools Committee, which is led by Ms. Amy White. Ms. White. Good morning. Davis and colleagues, I'm Amy White, and I have the pleasure of serving um, as the chair, along with Ms. Jo Kamnitz for the Education, Innovation, and Charter School Committee. We're going to kick off our morning with EICS 1 um, with a discussion about the 2021 Charter School Application Revisions. This is going to be an action on first read item. Um, board members, as you know, um, 
we are the state board is uh, charged with approving the charter school application timeline and and the process prior to each application round and we approved the timeline and process um, at the april meeting but there are some revisions um, regarding some formatting that we need to approve um, and just as a reminder the um, that application process is going to begin um, at the end of this month. So it's incumbent upon us to, to make those uh, revisions uh, this month on action on first read. Mr. Machado is going to walk you through those minor changes. Mr. Machado. Thank you, Ms. White. Uh, as Ms. White said, there are several minor changes to the application, basically the same as what we've had the last several years. We are making a, uh, bigger emphasis on the application on the six legislative reasons for charter schools. Always a lot of discussion at the board table for are our charter schools truly meeting one of the six reasons for charter. So we are uh, making sure that's more emphasis in the application. Um, adding questions about a, if you wanna do a single gender charter school, making sure that the three questions that were asked of the one school this year, uh, that they are answered in the application. We are also trying to clearly identify if a applicant is being assisted by a charter support organization. Often there's consultants in the field that will um, charge a fee to write an application. And we wanna make sure that that is duly noted on the application. Uh, that is the three major changes that we're making. And again, as Ms. White said, we are asking for action on first read because believe it or not, the application cycle is opening up again at the end of this month. Thank you, Mr. Machado. Board members, do you have any questions about the revisions that have been presented to you today? Okay, hearing none. Thank you, Mr. Machado. Stay, stay with us. Um, we'll move to EICS2, our second item for action on first read. And this is a request for the approval of the calendar for our one school in the Innovative School District, that's Southside Ashpole Elementary. As you know, the State Board of Education is the board that makes the decisions for this school. So I have Dr. Derek Jordan, who's gonna walk you through the academic calendar. Dr. Jordan, welcome. Good morning, Ms. White. I am gonna stand in the stead of Dr. Jordan this morning. Hello, Chairman Davis and Superintendent Truitt and members of the State Board of Education. I am Dr. James C. Ellaby, the Innovative School District Superintendent. I am here today to request the approval of the draft 2021-22 academic calendar for Southside Ashpole Elementary School in Roland, North Carolina. A copy of the calendar was submitted for your review and shows the days allocated for instruction, teacher work days and holidays. As a flexibility reminder, Southside Ashpole Elementary operates on an extended learning day. The proposed calendar complies with general statute and can be supported by the public schools of Robertson County since they support us in child nutrition, transportation, and auxiliary services. Our input process included the Southside Ashpole School Improvement Team which includes parent representatives, along with the school leadership, the public schools of Robinson County, NCDPI, and as well as the North Carolina General Assembly academic calendar legislation. Do I have any questions at this time? Any questions from board members about the calendar for Southside Ashpole for the upcoming school year? 2021, 2022. Uh, Ms. White? Uh, yes. I was trying to do a quick count on the calendar. How many total in session days are there for the calendar for next year? That is instructional days. Instructional days, and I don't have the numbers before me, but we uh, counted those several times. And so we are really over the number of hours, hours that we are required for instructional calendar days. I understand we're over the number of hours, but instructional days are important for these students. And so I'm wondering how many instructional days we have. 
Yes, sir. Slide. I'm, I'm not doing a good job counting it. I apologize for that. But do you, do you know the number of days? No, sir. I don't know it. Uh, right on. I, I do have that data, and I can send it to you real quickly. So I get back to my computer, but I don't remember it right off. That'd be great. Thank you. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Dr. Ellerby, if you wouldn't mind um, capture, using your team to capture that information, and I'll try to circle back to you um, maybe before the, um, by the time we finish our agenda, we've got a, a discussion on the charter school annual report that might give you the time to, to secure that data. Would that be okay? Yes, ma'am. I'll get that to you right away. That is fantastic. Thank you so much. Any other questions on the calendar? This is Olivia. I have just a very quick question. Yes, ma'am. Dr. Ellen. Dr. Thank you, Ms. White. Um, so remind me again, does the, does the uh, public schools of Robinson County have to approve or they don't have to approve the uh, calendar? They, they don't, don't have to approve the calendar, uh, but we do include them in the process. Discussion. Yes, so that we can make sure uh, Dr. Williamson has been excellent in collaborating with this whole team. And so they have gone over the calendar with us as well. Very good. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Any other questions? Okay, Dr. Ellerby, we'll return to you after we finish our discussion on EICS 8 to see if you have anything additional to add regarding the number of days, instructional days in that calendar. Okay, um, folks, let's move to EICS 3. Um, this is a request by uh, KIPP ENC and KIPP Charlotte to utilize a charter support organization. We did have uh, this information presented to us um, last month there are four schools kip gaston kip charlotte kip halifax and kip durham um, that were all under the um the the, the kip title and they're going to combine um using a um, charter support organization and mr machado can walk us through again this this request and answer any questions should you have any at this time and thank you again Ms. white Again, according to the State Board Policy, CHTR 021, uh, a charter support organization is allowed. This support organization will be serving all the KIPP schools in North Carolina, and they'll be providing technical assistance in the operating of the schools. This will include the financial services, HR services, student data management, uh, curriculum and coaching support, professional development for their teachers uh, and nonprofit board development. So they will serve as the, what I would, in, traditionally for a traditional public school, they're gonna serve similar to what the activities of what a central office would do for the charter schools. We feel like this is a great improvement where each individual KIPP charter school won't be responsible for these uh, activities, have an actual, uh, support management team that will be making sure that uh, all these functions are being done correctly. We know KIPP does an excellent job educating our students, and this will bring their organization up to that same level. Okay, questions from colleagues. Thanks, Mr. Machado, for that summary. Wonderful. Let's move then to EICS 4. This is a new policy um, regarding teacher contracts. As a brief reminder, back in 2018, um, state law permitted that non-career status teachers um, that have been employed by the, by the board for at least three years in a full-time permanent position um, could be considered for a one, two, or a four-year new or renewed employment contract. Well, teachers at each of our three residential schools are only considered for one year contracts and this policy would make the multi year option also available to them. Um, I had there, uh, Dr. Jordan as the lead on this. Is it uh, yes. Dr. Jordan going to? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Good morning, Dr. Jordan. Good morning, Miss White. And thank you so much. You did an excellent job and have uh, fully underscored the highlights. Uh, this policy will bring us in line with many other uh, units across uh, the state 
in allowing the opportunity for teachers to uh, be offered multi year contracts should they meet uh, the proposed criteria. Happy okay. to entertain any questions. Thank you, Dr. Jordan. Any remaining questions about this new policy um, before us that will greatly um, in increase our um, residential schools opportunity to recruit and retain um, excellent um, practitioners? Okay, I, I, I like I like it when folks are um, in agreement. Wonderful. Let's thank you, Dr. Jordan. Let's move to discussion. EICS 5 is a 2020 charter school annual report. This is a much anticipated report every year. It always generates a great degree of dialogue. I must share with you that um, Ms. Kamnitz, um, the vice chair and I um, were very excited about the hard work um, that Mr. Machado and his team um, put into this report uh, this year, um, reviewing comments from previous years from board, board members and questions that were asked um, repeatedly um, along same themes. They, they've worked hard to try to identify those and be very proactive and very transparent in the information that's presented. Um, Ms. Ashley Baccaro is going to walk us through this um, very informative presentation. But again, I just want to commend the OCS for all of the work um, that has happened behind the scenes to pull this together for us today. Ms. Baccaro? All right, thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Davis, Vice Chair Duncan, Superintendent Truitt, and board members and advisors. My name is Ashley Baccaro. I'm a consultant with the Office of Charter Schools and very excited to present the 2020 Charter Schools Annual Report to you. We have, um, as you can see here, a lot of ground to cover. Um, we will hit on all of the this information and feel free to stop me with questions. And of course, um, I will be happy to answer questions at the conclusion of the presentation. If we take a look at the, um, the history of North Carolina charter schools, the um, Charter Schools Act was passed in 1996, and it authorized the establishment of a system of charter schools. That system had an objective of six different objectives, as you can see here. Um, all of these objectives are um, considered, they are part of the application process, um, the ready to open process, and they are reviewed during our monitoring and during the renewal processes. As part of the Charter School Act, um, there is a reporting requirement that the state board report to the um, General Assembly. Previously, it had been each year um, at, or excuse me, February 15th. It is changed now to June 15th of each year, and it has four specific requirements. Um, the current and projected impact of charter schools on the delivery of services by public schools, student academic progress in charter schools, best practices, and any other appropriate information. If we take, um, start with a rather broad look at the current North Carolina charter school choice and demand as of October 1st, 2020, we have over 126,000 North Carolina students enrolled in charter schools. Self-reported data from those charter schools indicate that 78% of charter schools had a wait list, totaling nearly 76,000 students statewide. And as um, noted on the first page of the report, this certainly includes um, duplicates because we do have parents that will in, uh, apply to multiple schools primarily in our large districts with multiple charter options. There are 200 operating charters as of today in the state. And for this current school year, um, district schools saw declines in ADM for all but one grade level, um, while charter schools saw increases in all grade levels. So where does charter school authority and oversight lie? 
Um, Article 14A assigns your board, the State Board of Education, sole authority of charter school oversight, including the approval of charter applications, um, revisions, otherwise known as amendments, and the renewal of charter agreements. Your board is assisted by the Charter Schools Advisory Board, the CSAB, and CSAB is assisted by our office, the Office of Charter Schools. This next slide just gives you a um, an overview of our current CSAB board composition. I will note that um, one member has since resigned and we do also have another member who is um, soon to resign. So as you can see, there will certainly be some changes um, occurring in the, you know, soon. So let's take a look at our office, the Office of Charter Schools within DPI and what, um, what we do to serve charter schools. Our uh, mission it is that we exist to sustain the success of quality charter schools through operations, compliance, and support. We are currently staffed by six consultants, a program admin, and an executive director. And um, how we divide our, our workflows is by um, kind of topically, which you'll see on the next slide, and each consultant leads at least one of these workflows and supports multiple uh, other workflows. So we, um, we process amendments, which again are those revisions to a charter application. We prepare and implement, uh, manage the CSAB meetings. We prepare for state board meetings. We um, basically run the application process for a nonprofit board that wants to become a charter school. We handle communication and data requests pertaining to charter schools, the performance framework, which we will we will talk about today, the planning year, which is um, the year or two prior to opening to help schools become uh, prepared, professional development, the renewal process, um, a rather new um, workflow, which is handling all of the reports that are generated, and then also working through the rules process a risk assessment team, and stakeholder support. <clears throat> this shows um, OCS staffing and charter school growth from 2009 um, to uh, 2020. As you can see, we have um, over, we have more than doubled um, in the number of charter schools and um, the staffing numbers speak for themselves. Um, the the numbers there for staffing is um, it is an average of each each month's total staffing for that year as it compares to the number of charter schools for that year. We currently have um, two hundred charter schools. Uh, so that office we currently have um, two hundred charter schools we're supporting. We have nineteen schools in the ready to open process. Um, and then we also support any charter school applicant boards um, that are, which number of course fluctuates each year, depending on how many applications are received by the state. Alongside our OCS staff, we have an NC access program. This is a, um, a within our office, but a separate team um, that implements the NC access grants. And this team presents an annual report to you each year um, and you also hear from them actually next month for their 2021 grant recommendations. So I will just briefly uh, discuss the program, but it is a CSP grant program that will award uh, over six, $36 million directly to schools um, with the goal of serving uh, more educationally disadvantaged students. We currently have 42 charter schools um, that are in this program. Some first year stats, the first year there were six sub grantees enrolling over 250 additional educationally disadvantaged students um, and increasing the racial diversity of their charter schools. Every grant recipient utilizes a weighted admissions process, which um, I will also speak more directly to later in this report, provides transportation and a lunch program. And um, another part of the NC Access program is um, the Access Fellowship, and this creates a cohort throughout the life of the, the grant will create a cohort of 160 charter school leaders um, that have completed the fellowship 
and it includes really great um, routine professional developments, um, collaborative efforts. In addition to the grant leaders um, or recipients, we also have visiting fellows from schools that perhaps um, could definitely use the training but may not qualify for one of these grants. And the team has also invited um, fellows through the non-charter restart schools. They also have started an educational equity aspiring minority leaders program um, in collaboration with Appalachian State University. And they offer free high quality professional development um, throughout the program to all charter school leaders, teachers, and staff. So let's talk a little bit about accountability um, in the charter school war world. So charter schools are held accountable. They are held accountable through a system of statute rules policy through each um, school's charter agreement. They have academic monitoring just like other um, public schools. They are part of the accountability system. They have something called the performance framework, which I will speak um, about briefly. And of course, the renewal process and closure and termination. So if a school, a charter school does not meet the standards and the requirements um, for accountability, they will face closure or um, charter termination. At the conclusion of the previous school year, we had one school that closed its doors due to a um, inability to receive a charter renewal term. We also had one last year that relinquished due to trouble um, maintaining its enrollment. And this school, yeah, this year we do have a school that will close due to revocation. Charter terminations um, and closures, they fall, fall into four categories. And you'll see on the next slide kind of how that um, how that tallies up in the history of charter schools here in North Carolina. We have had 17 charters that have become revoked. We have had one assumed, 10 have been non-renewed, and 48 have been relinquished. Um, relinquished is when a, a charter school voluntarily gives up its charter, and um, oftentimes this happens because they, um, and especially with our operating schools, this often ha happens because they realize that they are struggling and that is the best um, the best decision for their, their students. We also have many schools that relinquish prior to opening, but that are in that planning year time. Um, and lately that has been mainly because of difficulties with um, facilities, finding facilities. Another large component of Charter school accountability is the, called the performance framework and several other states and authorizers use something similar to this. Um, it is an annual review of charter schools um, and it directly relates to the charters or the state board of education's goal to increase um, schools meeting academic operational and financial goals. So this. Um, this uh, system started in 2014. As you can see here, there was certainly a learning curve for schools. Um, and it's the method really by which our office can monitor academic, operational, and financial compliance. It is not simply a check the box sort of situation. Um, a team in our office using a system called Epicenter receives documentation from schools. Um, there is more information in the, the report that has been submitted in the appendix that shows the extent of that, but it covers everything from reviewing fire inspections to um, conflict of interest policies. It, it really runs um, through several different areas. Um, and to put that in perspective for this performance framework um, on which I'm reporting, that team in our office reviewed 3,741 documents. Um, and those those were the original documents submitted. Oftentimes they have to be reviewed and then revised to meet standards or to just provide best practices to schools. Um, however, you can see on this chart that we have seen a great improvement in the schools that are meeting or exceeding the goals. And we attribute this to um, providing very good one-on-one um, -on -one school support. The consultant, uh, Joseph Letario, that leads this currently has really made that a priority. 
the timeline has been staggered so that schools have more time to prepare for this. And um, we use now a system, a software system that really makes it easier to um, on all parties involved to review these. If we look at overall compliance for this previous year, um, you can see that two schools did not meet operational standards, um, which means that they, they received below 80% of um, what we are we are looking at. There were no renewal schools that um, did not meet, and we had six schools that were placed on financial non-compliance. Um, for financial, obviously, it's meeting or not meeting. There's no exceeding. And we off, we usually have academic scores on here, but due to the pandemic, there was no um, academic accountability data. Looking at charter growth over the um, the life really of the North Carolina charter movement, we have um, we see that there was a steady um, kind of slower increase as we got towards 2011, which is when the cap, the original 100 cap was lifted. And since that cap was lifted, we has have um, doubled from 100 to 200 charter schools operating this year. This um, mirrors what we see uh, if you look at nationwide um, data, the National Center for Education Statistics publishes a digestive ed statistics, um, their latest digest, which um, covered up to 2019, showed an increase of 2.8 million students nationwide selecting charter schools um, between 1999 and 2017. Now, if we zero in on this pre, uh, this current school year, we had seven new operating schools. We currently have 10 schools scheduled to open in 2021. Um, we will have, we will be bringing you a relinquishment soon, so that that number will decrease. Um, we had 25 charter applications received, three accelerated approvals, and five standard approvals. For this report, we took a look at the trends for char charter application approval rates um, since 1997. And um, you can see there's been some, some up and downs. Um, primarily, you can see that we had high numbers when the Charter School um, Act was passed. And then again, after the cap was lifted, we saw some very high application numbers. Um, but the approvals have stayed pretty steady and the uh, average percentage of applications approved by your board each year is 25.28%. So about a quarter of applicants will actually get approved. So let's take a look at the, um, the students, the ones that are attending our charter schools. This is a map of our current charters by county. As you can see, it covers um, the, the breadth of the, the state. We have 198 brick and mortar charter <laughs> schools, which are operating in 65 counties. And then our two virtual schools have headquarters, um, brick and mortar headquarters in Durham County. As of October 1st, 2020, there are 126 1,165 students being served by charter schools. The demographic data um, in this presentation I will present is coming from the Common Education Data Analysis and Reporting System, also known as CEDARS, which is North Carolina's pre-K to 13 state longitudinal data system. Um, most of this data is I've chosen a point in time to pull this data that aligns with federal reporting. So, um, for example, this is our this is showing you the racial and ethnic composition of charters compared to traditional LEAs as of October 1st, 2020. Um, you can see that the two main differences are in our Hispanic demographic and white demographic. For the next few slides, we have broken down the specific demographic groups and we wanted to look at trends over the last um, decade. You can see that um, the American Indi Indian or Alaskan Native 
demographic has um, decreased. And this mirrors a similar decrease we see in North Carolina public schools as a whole. Um, likewise, we see an increase in Asian students attending charter schools. Um, and this is also what we see statewide. We see an increase of Asian um, public school students. For our black or African American students, um, although there has been some fluctuation, it has remained fairly steady in North Carolina charter schools. Um, and conversely, the total enrollment in North Carolina public schools as a whole has decreased in the state um, over the last decade. Our Hispanic um, students, this is where we see the biggest growth, growth in terms of demographic groups. Um, and this also mirrors statewide data. Um, from 2000 to 2017, our public schools statewide, including charters, um, saw a demographic jump of 4.4% to 17.5%. Um, so this is an area that should and um, where the data should and definitely could impact policy and procedures. Um, and for our office, we we look and we're trying to support our schools in um, being able to best serve a rising Hispanic population and those families. Next, we have um, Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander. And um, as you can see, this is a very small demographic group that has fluctuated a bit, but um is not it's, it's a very small group for two or more races um this has increased um and this is also we are also seeing this statewide in all public schools an increase in this demographic group white students um there has been a decrease in the white student population um, from about just over 62% in 2010 to um, just over 51% in this uh, past reporting year. These are our um, students with disabilities attending charter schools. So um, as of December 1st, 2020, that federal headcount, there were 12,752 students um, identified as students with disabilities attending charter schools. That's 10.20% of um, enrollment. And conversely, district schools enrolled 12.26% um, students with disabilities. The um, English language learners, as of the October 1st, 2020 headcount, um, charter schools enrolled 3.3% while district schools enrolled 8%. Um, while our weighted lottery schools must wait for economically disadvantaged, they also have the option of including educationally disadvantaged groups, and um, one such group is English learners. And so we hope that we can, we can see a um, increase in the number of charters that are serving more English learners, especially as that demographic group expands within the state. This is um, the percentage of charter students that are identified as economically disadvantaged. Um, as of June 30th, 2020, charter schools enrolled 22.48% economically disadvantaged students and uh, traditional district schools reported 43.24% economically disadvantaged students. Um, there has been a, a variance, as you can see on this graph, that ranges um, really about 10 percentage points, depending on the, the year. Um, and economically disadvantaged identification has certainly been a discussion um, within our office, within DPI, and how to best um, identify those students so that the accurate, the adequate resources are routed to those schools and those students that most need them. Um, it's a little bit more difficult with charter schools, many of which do not 
participate in the national school lunch program, so they do not have those numbers to serve as a proxy for um, ED kids. And um, as noted in the report, this is not a simply a charter school issue. It's not a just a North Carolina question, um, but really there are reports across the country about schools and districts um, trying to better identify those students that most need um, assistance. All right, <clears throat> charter school access. One way we are hoping to improve access to charter schools for all students is through the use of a weighted lottery. A weighted lottery is a lottery procedure that provides additional weight to specific subgroups of students. Um, most, all of our schools that utilize a weighted lottery must wait for economically disadvantaged students, but there is also a federal category called educationally disadvantaged, which includes other subsets of students, and they can choose to wait for those as well. So you can see here that there's been a, a um, pretty significant increase in the number of schools that have been approved to use weighted lotteries um, between 2013 and this current year, 2021. Uh, this is the date I had as of March 10th. <clears throat> um, in terms of transportation, charters are required to make sure that they have a plan in place so that no child is unable to attend a charter school due to transportation needs. Um, however, they are not required to provide a specific type of transportation, um, but over half of our schools do provide fresh bus transportation and many provide um, some type of coordinated carpool or other type of transportation service. Child nutrition, um, again, just like transportation, they are not required to participate in the national school lunch program, but they are required to have a plan to ensure that every child is receiving adequate child nutrition within a charter school. So um, we have 73 schools and this continu continues to grow and we're really excited to see that, um, that participate in the national school lunch program. Another 80 schools provide some type of reduced lunch programming. Um, 30 schools do not provide a specific program. 11 provide um, as needed, so they they identify those students that need assistance. And then three provide a full lunch program, but they do not do it. They self fund it. They do not do it through the um, national school lunch program. Usually, um, a large portion of this um, presentation would be academic performance. And as you know, we don't have that accountability data. However, um, we did want to report on some changes with academic um, in the academic area of charter schools. Um, so uh, state law this year did require that schools previously identified as low performing or continually low performing continue to be identified as such. Um, and therefore they have specific requirements. So our, um, our charter schools that are identified as low performing or continually low performing, and you can see here what that, how that is determined. They are required to make that um, publicly available on their web, website, stakeholders are aware. They are required to submit school improvement plans to DPI. Um, they have been appearing and continue to appear before the CSAB, and they submit internal data and reporting to our office um, just for us to get a better grasp on, on how schools are doing and what type of internal data they are seeing. In addition, because charter schools close, we usually have, you know, there, there have been many closures, as you've seen. Um, we have, our numbers have changed um, in terms of what we see for low performing schools. That is because three of our low performing schools have closed since the 2018 19 data was released and one is pending closure. So for this upcoming school year, we will have 43 charter schools that are considered low performing. 35 are classified as CLP. Um, five of those were not low performing in the previous um, data year. And so we were hoping to see them come out of that low performing status. And then eight schools were classified as low performing, but they were not continually low performing. 
in lieu of um, acad new academic data, we wanted to get a better understanding of how our charters were operating and um, how they were serving their students during the pandemic. So we did survey them. We had 98% of our charter schools respond. Um, and these are just some highlights. There's more information in the report about what we we saw. 61% um, collaborated with other schools, including district schools. 98% distributed devices. 77 provided internet access and assistance. Um, nearly 90% provided a combination of asynchronous and synchronous. 97% provided regular academic and personal check-ins with students, um, which we know was is has been very uh, important to our students and our families that attend charter schools. And 70% provided tutoring and interventions. I've also linked here to um, charter schools that are receiving COVID funds um, and have used for you know, various reasons, including PPE and technology and in summer programming. All right, the impact on districts. So for this previous school year, um, charter school average daily membership accounted for 7.5% of the state's total ADM. There is specific um, district by district information in the appendix of this of the report. If we look at where we are most seeing charter school membership within um, local LEAs, Um, this shows our the district, the 15 districts with the um, largest kind of share, market share of charter school enrollment. So out of these 15, they are all actually rural, um, considered rural counties with the exception of Durham Public Schools. If we look at this uh, regionally, the highest percent of charter, charter membership is found in the Southwest region, which includes the Charlotte, Mac, and Union County areas, um, which tend to have a greater variety of charter schools. And then the North Central um, region, which includes Durham and Wake. Um, other impacts include fiscal. Um, this is always a rather controversial topic. Um, however, the latest report, the most recent report, we could find that um, specifically included data from North Carolina, including 18 years of data, um, found that in specifically in North Carolina, when there was an increase in charter school enrollment or market share, um, there was not a um, decrease in revenue or spending in traditional district schools. In terms of collaboration, um, we would certainly love to see more collaboration between charter schools and districts. Um, one specific program was highlighted in the report because it has um, been established for a few years now, and it's really seen some wonderful things in terms of parent engagement and um, just coming together to better serve the students and the families. Um, and that involves a Charlotte Met District School and a um, Charlotte Charter School. And then finally, um, facilities, charter school square footage across the state now totals approximately um, well, over 11 million square feet. Um, and as a reminder, charter schools do not receive local capital funding and they also do not receive lottery capital funding for buildings. All right. Um, so. This is the, I saved the best for last, hopefully. Um, this is an area we are excited to share and hope that this year's report um, can kind of paint a picture of the very diverse and unique practices that we're seeing in different um, charter schools around the state. So one area we're seeing, um, I kind of broke these into topics. Um, one is scheduling and, and organizational structure, structure in schools. So we are seeing looping. We are seeing very creative different types of uh, student groups and advisories with adult mentors. Many of our charter schools provide extended day and Saturday academies, which are different from before and after care, which also which often are you know offered at schools, but can be costly. Um, 
flexible grouping, remote learning interventions, and um, remote scheduling. Some of our schools pivoted to actually offering classes at um, in, in the evenings or in time, you know, kind of traditionally non school times to better serve children that may not have parental or guardian like assistance at home because mom or dad or a guardian is working. Um, in addition, many of our charter schools missions focus on specific types of curriculum or programming. And um, this is probably a, a draw for many parents that want a specific type of education. And as you can see here, um, we have schools that provide programming in a vast um, assortment of different types of education. Uh, parent and parents and guardians are also drawn to things beyond academics. So um, when they're trying to make a choice for what best serves their students, um, sometimes it's not just academics they're looking at. They're looking at a warm student and uh, school culture. They're looking at grading practices, um, discipline practices, what kind of um, kind of those those wraparound services are available and best um, fit the needs of their individual children. And we see all of these at our at our charter schools. In addition, um, we see a variety of social justice, equity and discipline practices. Um, and in fact, 74 of our schools reported that they have implemented some type of innovative discipline or restorative justice component that directly led to a decrease in suspensions. Um, there are also a variety of different types of um, programs like Systems of Justice, which is a Montessori program and Peaceful Schools, um, some very interesting programming. And then finally, many of our charter schools um, receive awards or recognitions. We had four schools this year that received Purple Star Awards for supporting military families. There were three um, North Carolina charter schools that were selected for the Canopy Project, which is a very interesting um, nationwide research project looking to kind of build collective knowledge on what's working in schools and how to be innovative. We had a state school of character um, Union Academy. The um, in addition, the first Blue Zones project was approved in the state of North Carolina, and that was at um, one of our charter schools, Brevard Academy. Uh, Blue Zones is a, I'm sure many of you have heard about, about it, but it's an organization, um, a practice that um, seeks to improve community well-being, physically, mentally, um, those type of health concerns. Uh, Central Park School for Children, this is a Durham charter school, and they are part of Century Foundation's Bridges Collaborative. Um, they are one of the only charter schools, and um, they also uh, partner. There are some other um, traditional districts that are part of this collaborative, and they are fostering collaboration between schools and housing partners. We had um, a 2021 model school from the International Center for Leadership and Education, that's Peak Academy. And then finally, a number of recognitions in academics, scholarships, including um, the very prestigious Quest Bridge Scholarship um, that was awarded to a student out of Thomas Jefferson Classical Academy, athletic reward, awards, robotics, and more. Um, so at this time, I am happy to answer any questions you may have. Ms. Baccaro, thank you so much for all of the information that you and your team work to pull together today for this annual report, report um, incredibly um, rich in data, um, thorough in its um, presentation. And um, I know that my colleagues have questions and I'll turn to them at this time for anyone who wants to ask a question. Chairman White, Glendale. Uh, Mr. Hall. Thank you. It's not a it's not a question. It's a request that I have uh, concerning the canopy project that you mentioned that three of the charters were involved in. Yes. I would just like, could you uh, email me or whatever more information about the canopy project? 
Absolutely. Thank you. Uh huh. And I think um, I'm not sure, but I, <clears throat> when I could, I tried to link to some of these things in the report. Um, but I will definitely email in email you as well. I will appreciate. It. Mm -hmm. Who else has a question? Ms. White. Uh, yes. This is Alan Duncan. Um, and good morning to you. Um, I had uh. Three comments and a couple of questions. The comments were thank you very much for this report. It's uh, it reflects a lot of work and attentiveness and going uh, beyond where reports have in the past, as you suggested with your goal. So I want to thank uh, Mr. Machado, you, and thank um, Mr. Caro and all the other members of the staff for the work that's obviously reflected in trying to put this. Report together, which is a very helpful thing for education across the great state. So that's a, always a good place to start as we think. The second, um, just quick observation is that I am anxious for our charter school students as I am for all of our traditional school, um, public school students as well to be back in a place where we can go back to have assessments and have good academic data for where our students are. So that we can find out where they are and then be able to meet them there and then look at them forward. So I know you're anxious for that as well. But not something we can do a whole lot about under all the circumstances right now. Uh the third uh thing is I very much appreciate the best practices um portion which has been added into the report this year. I think and it was very well done in terms of how it's divided out into different areas and different uh points of emphasis, if you will. So I, I thought that was extremely helpful. Um, well done in, in the whole idea behind charters, at least originally, was that we were trying to develop best practices and all schools would would learn from them. So it really goes to the spirit of the of the intent of what we're trying to do with our charter schools in this state. So um, I think uh, that's very helpful and it's actually caused me to have a thought which is um, we we should do a at Superintendent Trudeau, I'm turning to you. We should do a best practices for coming out of all traditional schools as well. You're you're seeing some of those, and then we should be able to cross compare, look at. Um, Mr. Bashan, I apologize for not looking at you, but I'm getting too yeah. far away from the mic. So <laughs> no apologies. Uh, circumstances we're in. But it really lends itself to we, we should emphasize those from the traditional schools. We should take a look across you know, where the best practices are and share those practices for traditional schools and for charter schools uh, across the state because those best practices and things that are really succeeding for our kids are things we want to help for all of our students around the state. But I hope that we will. Uh, I, I know it's work to put together these reports, but that's valuable work that I think the districts could could gain from. So I would ask Superintendent if we could take a look at uh, taking advantage of the work that's been done here and expanding upon it, if you will. Moving to questions. Um, my first question is um, after. Well, my first observation is is that during the time of the mini grants that we've had. Looking at one of the charts that was put up there, and the charts are also well done. It appears that the number of economically disadvantaged students that we have during the time of the grant in our charter schools has decreased and not increased. Can you give an explanation of why that might be, or do you have any theories as to why that might be? Um, I would, I mean, I think one, it goes back to, um, what I spoke about in terms of accurately identifying those students, um, because over half of our schools don't participate in national school lunch program. They don't have those direct numbers that are usually pulled from that program. Um, and when they are asked, you know, many of our schools ask to ask families to self identify or self report for programming within the school, um, which is fine, but also causes issues in terms of one, they may not want to, um, but that data is not, that data cannot be verified by DPI. So it cannot be used for the federal reporting, which is where these numbers come from. That also, if I can, Ms. Duncan. Yeah, please. Uh, we're looking at the very cohort one for the very yeah. first year. 
So I don't believe we've had time to get more EDS students into our schools by either the weighted lottery, advertising to the correct communities. This was just the first year and this pretty much uh, uh, was what, what happened at the, at the moment. I think you, I'm confident we will see the increase, particularly with the results from cohort two, where that uh, EDS population is gonna rise. Uh, and also, as Ashley mentioned, uh, most of the identification for economic disadvantage for our schools comes from direct certification database, which is a family must ask for assistance before they get into that database. So I'm not gonna blame it all on the reporting mechanism that's being used. I do think it's uh, biggest reason is it was just year one in, in the grant was just getting kicked off. These schools were just getting into the practice of advertising, reaching out and using their way to lottery. Given that, I think, according to the information that was shared in the report, that the charter school economically disadvantaged student percentage is around 22% based on the data that you do have, and the traditional schools are around 44%, there's a, there is a significant difference between the two. Is the, is the goal of shooting for, if somebody commits to the mini grant, my understanding is they have to have to get somewhere between them minimum of 15% of students and a uh, do not need to exceed 45% that would qualify for EDS classification. Uh, is that required by the grant, that percentage range, or is that one that we have set, set ourselves? The grant is a competitive grant. So if we're looking at the applications in one school applicants, say I'm gonna increase, our goal is 15%. This school is 30%, obviously the of being a better grant that applicant that had a higher goal, attainable goal, get the uh, get the recommendation for the grant. That make if I'm answering your question. Yeah, well, I guess real. I'm really asking that we awarded schools at 15% the grant. You know, that is the lower side of the scale. Do we need to look at adjusting the scale in order to help increase our actual EDS percentage through the initiative of the grant? Yes, and um, we will give you that exact data when we do our NC Access annual report, and I think we'll touch briefly on it next month when we uh, make recommendations for cohort three. Uh, but uh, we might have a school that has 15, 1800 students. Their goal might to be increased by 15 to 20% versus, which is a lot larger number versus a school that maybe is 500 students and they are committed to raise that EDS to 25%. There, there's also a uh, issue with particularly our more mature established schools that they don't have a lot of room to grow quickly because their schools are so full. That's always a challenge also. So my last question then is, is the always painful one that relates to grants, which is, you know, in our first year, you indicated, you know, we haven't made progress, but you're very optimistic. You, we, we perhaps will make progress over the remainder of the grant period. What happens from a sustainability standpoint when the grant expires? Are we, what, what, what does that do for us in terms of our ongoing uh, support for and desire to spur an increase with our economically disadvantaged students having this opportunity? That's a great question. We we discuss that internally all the time. It's our hope that during the five years that the school has this grant and has access to these funds, that they're setting up sustainable practices, uh, processes. So when the money does finally run out, they have everything in place to continue to do it. I, I think that the money helps them get to that point of uh, lowering barriers. You could help them purchase Buses. They could help them establish their lunch program. Once that's done, we are very confident that they'll be able to sustain those same services without this money. And it's it's a matter of the grant plus reprioritizing their existing budget too. And I think that's all part of this uh, NC Access Fellows Program that we are doing a lot of professional development with our leaders to making sure that it is sustainable. All right. So thank you for those that information. Ms. White, this is Olivia. I have a couple of I want a couple of questions actually. 
Certainly, Dr. Roxanne. Thank you so much, uh, and thank you, Ms. Beccaro, for that fine report. It, it does take an incredible amount of time to pull together reports of that magnitude and doing your summaries and gathering data. So I'm very appreciative um, uh, for the effort that went into that document. My question has to do with, I believe one of your pie charts indicated a considerable percentage of charter schools have relinquished their charter. That is, it seems like that's longitudinal data that goes back to 1998. I believe that's correct. It's difficult to see you. Yes, yeah. you're, you're correct through these. Yes. yes, am I am I showing up as a little tiny person? <laughs> I am short. <laughs> um, the question, though, has to do with I wonder if that uh, percentage has declined over time. I would be interested in seeing some data of the relinquishments of charters over time. I do have that. Um, I can provide that data. We we keep that internally. Um, it has not every relinquishment has been, um, you know, tracked as with a reasoning as well as it maybe should have been over time in the office. Um, but we do try to, you know, include with a relinquishment why they have relinquished and. Um, certainly over, you know, since I've been at the office for 3 years, it's. A lot of them are related to um, facility, not being able to find a facility, which one of our RTO schools will request that next month. Um, <clears throat> and then also enrollment um, related trends. And we also see schools that are low performing or otherwise really struggling and um, knowing that the other option might be revocation. They decide to do what, you know, um, my opinion is the right thing to do and to relinquish that charter. Just a little bit of data around that. I mean, it's not urgent, but in the maybe near future, it would would be helpful. Certainly. And then the other question, it's not really a question, but it's a comment. I re seems like Lieutenant Governor Dan Forrest at one point had organized a task force devoted to building awareness among Hispanic families about the concept of a charter school and. If I recall correctly, it was just the con whole concept of a charter school was unclear to Hispanic families. Mm -hmm. And I, um, I think I recall of one of the PowerPoint frames where there, there might be a declining um, enrollment among Hispanic kids and charters. I wonder if that tool, a task force or something similar to a task force, a tool that would build, uh, keep that awareness out there among our Hispanic families about the availability, access of charters and um, just what is a charter? Well, we are, yes, we are, we are definitely actually seeing an increase um, in the number of Hispanic students choosing charter schools, um, but it is not, it is not keeping in line with the increase that traditional schools are seeing. Um, given the the surge in his, um, the Hispanic population in the state, so there certainly are. I don't know. I'm not a, familiar with that task force, but I think that certainly trying to um, spread awareness about what a charter school is and and opportunities that might be good fits for families. Um, that's something we're definitely trying to help our our schools with. Thank you very much, and. Uh, Jamie Falkenberry might be of uh, a resource to probe and ask questions about the status of of that group. I'm not saying to just just something along those lines might be the a strategy to keep that awareness out there growing. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you. Roxanne, if I can just add to that, uh, I am familiar with that report, and we are trying to incorporate uh, some of the best practices. We are encouraging our schools to, to make sure that all their advertising material is in Spanish as well as English, that they try to have a bilingual person at their front desk to make sure the Hispanic community when they come uh, feels comfortable. We are uh, encouraging them to market into that community. So but some of the things that were brought up in that task force, uh, we have been trying to institute or encouraging our schools to institute. But Thank that's you a, very much. That's a great that's point. Thank you. Very good ideas. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. White. And, and in closing, um, I'd like to thank the state board for the input that you've given us over the last three years of what you'd like to see this report be. I also want to thank the general assembly for moving the due date from January to June. 
gave us so much more time to prepare a good report. And I absolutely want to thank Ms. Pacero and her team for putting together a fantastic uh, annual report. So thank you. And certainly uh, I echo those comments as well. Great, the uh, board members, this is an item for discussion. So you've got a whole month to dig in and think about any other questions and certainly reach out to the Office of Charter Schools if you need additional information. The report will be back before us next month um, for approval. We will move to EICS 6 then, and this is a request from Wake Prep Academy um, to relocate. It is currently in its um, second year delay and had originally um, sought uh, land in Northern Wake County. Um, normally when a charter school um, is relocating within five miles, it does not have to come before the state board for another approval. But this time, this school is has found property about a mile away, but it crosses into an adjacent county. So Mr. Machado is going to walk us through the request. Mr. Machado. Thank you, Ms. White. As Ms. White said, Wake Prep will begin their second year delay next year. They are due to open up in August of 2022. They're uh, approved to open up K-12 with 1,620 students. Their application said they wanted to locate in the town of Wake Forest. Uh, they were not, the town planning board and the town council denied them a building permit uh, through the zoning process. They have appealed that to the Superior Court when I mean, it was denied and now they're taking it to the North Carolina Appeal Appellate Court. There is no temporary facility that they could move into while this legal action is going on. So in due to the legal issues, Wake Prep understands that there's no site within the town limits of Wake Forest that they would be able to open because they would run into the exact same issue with the town council. So they're proposing that they relocate to Franklin County. This allows them to continue to serve the exact same uh, population that they said they would in their application. It is 1.4 miles from their originally proposed site and it's four tenths of a mile into Franklin County. They currently have over 7,000 students on their interest list. And on that interest list, 13% are from Franklin County. Their application stated that they anticipated 20% from Franklin County. So at this point, uh, they don't have, they don't foresee an uptake in the number of students coming from Franklin County. Wake Prep Academy has marketed heavily into the Wake Forest area. Again, they feel that uh, this move will not affect the number of students coming from Franklin County. Uh, Wake Prep Academy is, uh, has been approved for the NC Access Grant. No funds have been dispersed, but they are currently participating in the NC Access Fellows Program. They are going to be offering transportation, free and reduced lunch, and using a wage lottery. Part of their application was that they are committed to hiring a community outreach consultant to reach into the underserved areas to uh, in hopefully meet their targets of the EDS population. And this is an exact mirror of what happened to another school that Charter One is partnering with. It's Bonnie Cone Classical Academy. They've done the same thing about hiring a community outreach person, and they currently have. 56% of their population is non-white. Um, again, I'm happy to answer any questions. West, it is a discussion item. And as Ms. White said earlier, uh, because of going into another LEA, we needed to get State Board of Ed. Ms. White, this is Alan Dunk. You can ask a question, please. Yes, sir, by all means. Thank you. Um, Mr. Michaud, as you know, we've received some uh, thoughtful correspondence from leadership in Franklin County expressing concerns that they might have. And then we've also received some thoughtful correspondence from the applicant for, for the making the move um, in terms of, uh, uh, among other things, commitments to help resolve concerns that Franklin County has expressed. Is there a, is there a, is the intent as it comes back to us that the charter agreement itself would would 
uh, incorporate uh, the dealing with these concerns and the commitments made by the applicant in, in, as part of the agreement for the charter? I heard your question, Craig. You, you, are you asking me that uh, could that be part of the charter agreement? Yes. That a stipulation in your approval? Yes. It is certainly is my opinion that you certainly could put a stipulation into their charter agreement that they meet the requirements because it has a desegregation order right now. I think I'm understanding what you're asking me, but yeah. it certainly could be put in their uh, charter agreement. I will defer to legal. If, uh, well, I'm not asking a legal question. I'm asking that, you know, the, the, the school itself makes some uh, stated it would make some commitments and I'm assuming that that would be part of our, if we were to approve this, that would be part of the agreement. Yes, excuse me for misunderstanding your question. The applicant has committed to um, meeting all the requirements of that court order, and they uh, they sent a letter saying how they would do that, and I think it would be perfectly appropriate to put that, that into the char their charter agreement. All right, so whatever the proposed charter agreement is for our approval at the next meeting, that'll be part of our meeting materials for the next meeting, I take it. All right, thanks very much. Thank you for that question, Vice Chair Duncan. Other board members, do you have a question for Mr. Machado? Okay, thanks so much. Let's move to EICS 7. This is Movement School Eastland's request to increase its enrollment. And Mr. It's the Mr. Machado show today. So Mr. Machado, you wanna walk us through this request? Yes, Ms. White. Movement School Eastland is located in Mecklenburg County. Their first year of operation, they're currently K first grade. Their increase is greater than 30%. Uh, Movement School Eastland is requesting to increase its projected ADM from 285 students to 320 students, which is an additional 35 students. Because the school is in its first five years of their charter, they can defer back to what their charter application said in their second year, um, said that they are in a one year delay too, so it actually would be their third year said that they would be kindergarten, first and second grade with 285 students. And again, they're asking to increase that by 30, uh, 35 students to 320. Movement Eastland is uh, managed by the same nonprofit board that runs Movement Charlotte, which uh, is a replication of Sugar Creek Charter School in Charlotte, one of our most successful charter schools Movement serves a very high economically disadvantaged population. Um, charter school meets all requirements to for this approval. And we're happy that they have asked to increase their enrollment. They have the wait list that supports it. They are uh, serving that underserved population. And anybody that's familiar with Charlotte is the where the old Eastland Mall used to be. It's in that uh, that area. It was approved unanimously by CSAC. Summary, Mr. Machado. Questions from um, my board members on this request? Okay. Thanks so much, Mr. Machado, for your time today and all of the work that you um, do to provide materials for us to review. Um, the um, last um, item for today. Um, is EICS 8, and these are a collection of restart application um, submissions that will be before us for discussion and then approval next month from both Guilford and Wake County. Um, and today we have um, Dr. Cynthia Martin and Julie Garber presenting information um, to us, and I'll welcome these ladies to the floor and um, look forward to the presentation. 
Greetings, Ms. White. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, Superintendent Truett, Chairman Davis, board members and advisors, the Division of Transformation has reviewed 13 restart applications for your approval today. At this time, I will turn it over to Ms. Garber, who leads this work. Thank you, Dr. Martin. Good afternoon, Chairman Davis, Vice Chairman Duncan, Superintendent Truett, and board members and advisors. My name is Julie Garber, and I serve as the Reform Model Lead, as Dr. Martin mentioned, in the Division of Transformation. Um, to begin, we always like to connect the Reform Model work, and specifically the Restart Model, with your strategic plan. So we see here that goal number two is to improve school and district performance by 2025. Specifically, under Objective 7, in Component 1, we see directly a direct mention of restart schools with the goal to meet or exceed annual expected growth. And um, later on, when we talk about academic gain, you'll see both um, components represented there. I do want to pause for just a moment and acknowledge um, in listening to the um, great annual report from the Office of Charter Schools, and then Chairman Duncan's, excuse me, Vice Chairman Duncan's suggestion to encourage best practices across charter schools and traditionals. Um, the, the school that Ashley pointed out as a the connection between the movement charter and the tr traditional school, the traditional school is Ashley Park Pre-K, and that actually is a restart school. So um, we continue to really appreciate the connections with Office of Charter Schools. They are always um, extremely supportive of um, us in understanding the restart model, and um, we uh, appreciate the collaboration and the support as well. So just wanted to point that out. Um, and before we go over the applications, we thought that it would be best to just have a give you a, a reminder of where we've been. And so we've got a quick review for you of restart within the past um, year. So in March of 2020, the policy was updated to clarify academic gain components and then establish a five-year monitoring cycle for continued authorization. Then in December of 2020, the policy was updated to include an express commitment to the model through the duration of the cycle. Um, we also established a new application window as was recommended by the board, which goes from October through December to provide for an orientation to ensure that um, new schools were prepared um, to implement restart. We are still communicating this new application window to districts. And so today, the applications that are being presented to you, we were able to help these districts with their applications and still yet honor the recommended orientation. So we have time um, to be able to do that and we are working to, if of course they are approved, we will be able to schedule an orientation for um, all of these schools before they begin implementation. And then most recently, this past January and February, um, we were able to increase our DPI restart support with more full-time employees. So we now have four comprehensive support specialists who are um, directly supporting these schools. And we are grateful for that support. Um, as a review also, as I mentioned, um, here we have the approved components that identify if the school is demonstrating academic gain. Um, they are reviewed yearly, of course, when we do have performance data, um, but specifically at the five year review. This is when um, the academic gain components are reviewed. Um, and just again to point out, you see growth status included here as well as subgroup growth status that aligns with your state board goal. So in total, we currently have 139 restart schools. We track these schools by cohorts in order to follow the five year monitoring cycle. So now, as we move into the actual applications, the statutory requirement for the application is a designation of recurring low performing status. And as a reminder, recurring low performing status is identified as low performing in any two of the last three years. So in reviewing the applications, we always confirm 
from the um, accountability information that comes out publicly um, that the schools are indeed designated as recurring life performing. And then we always review the requested flexibilities to confirm that all the requests align with charter flexibility as based on statute. So here you have before you uh, the superintendent from Guilford County Schools is requesting for eight schools to be um, approved beginning in the in the upcoming school year. Guilford County Schools currently has 16 restart schools, and if approved, they would now have 24 restart schools. Um, just for your information, Guilford County Schools follow a very similar implementation across the district. They have advanced teaching roles. Um, they usually request flexibility in class size and budget um, in order to provide for these advanced teaching roles, and then professional development comes from these roles. Next, we have uh, Wake County Schools. And Wake County is requesting that five schools are approved beginning in the upcoming school year. Again, currently Wake County has 25 restart schools and if approved, they would now have 30 restart schools in total. Wake County is requesting uh, budget flexibility and their strategies on the application typically include um, a focus on professional development, instructional coaching support, instructional assistance for students and mentor program for BTs. Um, so with these proposed schools beginning to implement in the 2021-2022 school year, they would be a part of cohort five that you see at the bottom of the table. There are currently four schools in cohort five and with an, the additional 13, that would make a total of 17. And so that would make a new total of us of 152, if approved, restart schools. And with that, I will pass it back to you, Ms. White, and ask if there are any questions. Thank you so much, Ms. Garber, and really appreciate that background um, that sort of paints the picture of um, where we are and, and the applications before us today. Board members, do you have questions about um, the presentation? Ms. White, it's Matt Bristow-Smith. Yes, sir, Mr. Bristow-Smith. Well, first, I just have to say how nice it is to hear Julie Garber's uh, voice uh, coming through our call. Did not see Julie in person um, the last couple of days because of, um, you know, the the attendance at our planning and work session, but she is one of my favorites. I always love that when she presents to us and in person, she's normally smiling while she talks. She has an incredible skill to do that. So, Julie, thank you. Um, I miss seeing you. <laughs> thank you, Matt. Uh, <laughs> this is just a um, more of just a conceptual question. Um, restart schools in Edgecombe have been transformative. Um, we have a, a incredible feeder school. Uh, we call it the I zone. I think you're very familiar with it. And Donnell Cannon presented to the board last November at our planning and work session about the power of restart schools and the flexibility that um, the the state board and the agency has provided through the restart program to really help us innovate and unstick these schools. We're just generally um, it, are are there um, structural or um, you know are there reasons that the restart flexibilities are, are not more widely available to schools that are not persistently low performing. I know that it is a prerequisite that you have to be a persistently low performing school in order to qualify for restart models, but it just intuitively to me seems that um, they, to, to spark the kind of innovation and responsiveness to, to local context that, um, that we were so often talking about that most of the transferable flexibilities that restart schools have um, would even further empower and enable schools that are not low performing. So I just wanted to toss that out there um, for any kind of further discussion or um, feedback on that. That is an excellent question, Matt. I think that um, one of the, I'm sure that I, I believe from historical understanding when the um, statute was originally um, changed, you know, all of these restart models were originally federal models and then transferred, um, uh, uh, approved as and voted on as state models under that particular statute. Um, I believe those who were involved in the, um, in the creation of it had a desire that flexibility would be um, eventually open to others. Um, 
I, I think that that restart schools are a great opportunity to really investigate and see how um, how that we could um, see this opportunity for other schools. I think we do still have. Um, from my understanding and experience, I think we do still have a lot to learn on how they are operated across the state. There's still some differences and um, I would love to see more opportunity for innovation, even in those, those schools that we are currently running as restart schools. So I think um, I appreciate that you that you have brought it up and I think that um, Hopefully that we'll have other opportunities to bring it up in other settings and continue to ask this question. And Matt, this is Cynthia Martin. I would just add that we agree. We've heard the same sentiments. Uh, we are hoping to show um, what flexibilities can do for um, a school that may not be performing, but also any school. We hope to use this as a testament to that. And uh, we are operating within the policy that we have, but we support um, what you just raised up. Absolutely. And Bev Emery here, if I could also add while we're piling on um, our discussion about data uh, this week in the retreat, I do want to say that um, Julie's team and Dr. Martin have created a great annual report, and we actually have used that with um, Jamie Falkenberry and Freebird this this legislative session when questions have been asked because while it's beginning data, it is data. And to your point, Matt, I think if we can use these 150 schools to leverage what flexibility equates to in student impact, um, that's what we really need to do what you're asking. We have to demonstrate and lift up evidence that it works. And I think we're well on our way to do that. Coming on the heels of the charter school report and then the restart report, it does feel like there's a significant amount of cross pollination between the charters and the restarts and, and significant lessons learned that uh, we might be able to scale out based on uh, the proof of concepts that are clearly already in the works between those two initiatives. So I want to thank you all three for responding to my really unfair question. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> it's an excellent question. Great question. Others that might want to take this time to put something before her. Okay, hearing none. Thank you so much for. Um, I hear somebody in the background. Am I missing someone? Okay, hearing none. Thanks for uh, thanks for closing out EICS and that discussion on those um, restart schools that will be back before us next month for approval. Let's circle back quickly. If Dr. Ellerby is still on the call, we want to be responsive um, quickly to the number of instructional days um, that are before us for calendar approval at Southside Ashpole for the 21-22. Um, academic year. Dr. Ellerby, are you there? Yes, ma'am. I am here. Good Thank you. Good afternoon again. And we did verify again that there are 185 instructional days, which definitely meet the state requirements. And there are 1,193 instructional hours, which exceeds the state's requirement. Chairman Dunk, uh, Vice Chairman Dunk, is that satisfactory, sir? Thank you very much. All right, sir. Thank you, Ms. White. Thank you, Dr. Elby, for the quick turnaround on that information. So, Chair Davis, uh, we're closing out the Education, Innovation, and Charter School Committee report. We're going to be requesting approval today on EICS 1 through 4. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. White. We'll now break and be back in session at 1.30. 1.30. Everyone, please, please stay silent. Yes, we're still... Please, we're still are still streaming. <laughs> okay. 
everyone on the line. We are uh, going to break, returning at 1.30. We will turn the mics back on. Thank you.